Are you feeling stuck making minimum payments on your credit card debt? SaveWithConrad.com can help, and you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Oh, and did I mention no house payments for two months? Get rid of your credit card debt and lower your monthly payments right now at SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, race fans, Hall of Famer Daryl Walter here. You know it's time to drop the green flag on another edition of Meaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. So, hey, pull those bells tight one more time. Here's my buddy Hermie Sadler and Senator Bill Stanley. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Let's see what they have to say, boys and girls. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm leaning right. And I'm former NASCAR driver Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left, leaning right and turning left with Sadler and the Senator. And at least for this week, we're powered by Pace of Madden. <laughs> hey, Hermie, how you doing, bud? Not as good as you. No, I think we got a lot to talk about, man. We are, we should be at the at high atop the skyscraper at the Stanley Law Group offices, but we're not. And we're not because... Mother Nature has invaded my office and created a great flood, so much that I either have an indoor pool or I need to build an ark. So we are now at my apartment in Richmond, and we're going to introduce somebody else who's been missing a couple weeks and might have some explanations, but it's good to be with you. I know I'm going to drive you crazy for the next hour or so, but we got a great show. Hey, Hermie, how you doing? I think um, we're talking about you a lot at the hold, Capitol today. Holding water... <laughs> Is something, you know, it's a recurring theme with you. You traded in the C class for the A class, then right. they found some water in the walls. Now you yeah. are finding water in your office and Yeah, you're right. That's a that maybe, could be a maybe that's a sign. A sign. Yeah. And now I'm holding your water all the now time. Now you're holding my water. <laughs> Listen, what a what a, an exciting week we've had this past week. Been on vacation, but this podcast now, we are finally joined back by our semi-sidekick, kind of like a semi-fascist, semi-sidekick, who is f- fresh out on bail. He's out of jail. You have an incoming call from... Shep Moss. An inmate at the Mecklenburg County Correctional Facility. To accept this call, please press 1. <laughs> <laughs> call accepted. Ladies and gentlemen, back for another edition. We've missed him. We've missed his personality. He's right here with us now. Shep Moss, Councilman of the Burn Pile. Yeah, Shep it's Moss. Councilman Moss to you. Now, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> We're moving backwards. This is good. All right. So, Shep, uh, welcome back. Yeah, welcome well, back. Thank you. I jumped bail, went to Nassau for a few weeks. Oh, the Bahamas. Oh, yeah. Can you, uh, we want to talk about the trip to the Bahamas because sure. you did have a very extended vacation in the islands with your beautiful wife and some friends. But the last time our listening audience, heard from you you know we were talking about whether or not you were going to be spending some time in jail so can you just give us a quick yeah update on what's going on politics what, what, what has transpired corruption what has transpired south hill in the town of south hill since you were last a third member of the panel here crickets i mean absolutely crickets what? i have no no updates no idea. We uh, they had all these investigations going yeah, on. All the accusations, meetings, allegations, trespassing, FOIA request, FOIA request, no trespassing sign. You know, and, all the documents were completely destroyed, and they weren't. And that's about a month ago. It's been about a month and ago. And nothing has happened. Absolutely nothing. We has were happened. worried Other for your safety and freedom, and now uh, you're saying nothing. Well, we did respond to the FOIA request, my attorney and I, and. Um, Whoa, whoa, whoa. You got an attorney? I actually had to get an attorney. <laughs> like a real attorney. Like whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't do things for free. So if that's what you're saying, then that's why you got an attorney. But no, seriously. You got a very good attorney, by the way. Absolutely no uh, update or response or nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, so our meeting is at 12th. So wait, if we can ask, they had made a FOIA request for your phone records, your text messages, emails, emails, anything that would evidence any information that you received prior to your knowledge of a burn pile where the town of South Hill was taking documents, records, turned out to be some records that had personal information of maybe citizens or, Correct. or employees. You found out about it, thought it was improper, brought it from the darkness into the light, and Correct. they got mad. And they were going to get you and stick you. And they, they tried to, even if you remember, if you've listened to this podcast before, they're going to 
recommend that the Commonwealth's attorney arrest you for trespass. Correct. And you're telling me nothing's happened? Nothing has happened. Did you respond to the FOIA request? I did respond to the FOIA request and accept the uh, long in the tooth council member that was spearheading all of this. He did resign at the end of the last meeting. So that, that really was a true thing. That was kind of a not true dramatic. Thing. It that was, was not yeah, dramatic. I mean, it still was dramatic. But so right now you gave a FOIA response? Correct. Did you provide the records? I did not provide the names who sent the me citizens. the photograph of the citizens. And that's really what they're after. And you declined to do that based on legal grounds? Legal grounds, a FOIA exemption of uh, this was done as an investigatory process, which means the... Whistleblower. Yeah, whistleblower. Which so means you're protecting the citizens while you're fighting for to them, be protected. Man. That's correct. And he's All right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank that's you. But that's that's not that's not as much of excitement as I was hoping for. I was hoping we, well, our next meeting is at twelve next week. Okay, so all right, so that's when it could. Can you could make something up next time? Like there was a strip make search up something. before you yeah, came I mean, in. Any, any, give Maybe us something. cavity search. <laughs> that was in Nassau. Oh, what a oh, what a way! What a what a, what a, <laughs> show. What a boring report. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but now you have a chance to make up for it because to make up for all the. Uh, Issues and people, you know, all the drama going on in South Korea. You decided to take your wife to the Bahamas. I did. So can you? What can you tell us about? Wait, wait, we were trying to escape the jurisdiction of (laughs) South Hill. I really didn't take her to the Bahamas. I jumped bail. Yeah, you're you're, you're (laughs) avoiding extradition. I I like that. I like that better. Yeah, that's yes. You You know, spicing it up. You wanted excitement. That's some excitement. So you jumped bail. You went to the Bahamas, avoiding extradition, living under an assumed name, had a fake mustache. Keep going. It was great. We went down for about three days. We had a great time. Joined some friends down there. Uh, Absolutely no town business. We got a lot of sun, had a lot of Miami Vice drinks. What are those? That is, it, it's really amazing. It is <laughs> half strawberry daiquiri mm-hmm. mixed half with pina colada. Now, it sounds ultra sweet, ultra sugary, but it's not. The pineapple cancels out the strawberry. It's a very, very refreshing and smooth cocktail. I recommend all of our listeners try it. Right, my Miami Vice. That's as good as when I say the trail mix, the raisin count cancels out the M&M. And I will <laughs> I mean, tell you. And our weight loss challenge, it sounds like we might be in the running still there. Fair and up. listen, I'm going to tell you, if any of the listeners are going to Nassau, they must ask for one of the local guides there named The General. His business name is Surf and Turf Bahamas. Wait a minute. Well, Fantastic. Wait, wait, wait. This, this is not somebody that's yeah, advertised yeah. on our program. Right. We're uh, not. Right. Sponsor? We're not, is this a chef sponsor? You wanted to know about the trip. I'm trying to tell I you about the trip. Oh, but it sounds like you're you giving know a free. That, damn well, that ain't the kind of stuff we want to know about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying to sidestep what he's trying to get to. Yeah, no, the general. Isn't that the guy that sells insurance to, uh, to, uh, to Shaq? Surf and Turf Bahamas. Look him up on Instagram. Really? Ultimate guide. He took us out to some remote islands about 15 miles off the shore of nassau and then what happened <laughs> uh we saw sea turtles i bet you did <laughs> we went conch we went conch shell diving and we just had a great time it was a right, fantastic day wow no 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 i think <laughs> Damn, i'm more intrigued I, I, I think i'm more intrigued so for three days you spent a boatload of money to go down there well avoid prosecution and be served with a warrant you meet some guy named the general who's not selling insurance to Shaquille O'Neal. That's correct. You go conk diving, right? What else did you do? And you, you were drinking some fruity, like, uh, Bahamian version of the Arnold Palmer, right? Well, how many how many a day were you averaging of those? About six. Okay. How, in a tall glass, one of those flamenco glasses? No, one just one? a solo cup. Solo cup. Yeah. And was the general feeding them to you? Uh, yes. You took care of all your marijuana needs? Every, no, your, no, well, you just no, said every, no. Wait, whoa. Yeah. I thought you said marriage. No, marijuana, <laughs> hell, no. that's one thing that will get you in trouble in Bahamas. What? Yes. I thought they loved the marijuana. No, there. that's Jamaica. Doesn't Senator Louise Lucas have like a shop down there, a CBD shop? No? Couldn't tell you. Really? Could not tell Okay, you. Herman, you want to pick this up from here? I am just... <laughs> really well, disappointed with the well yeah. look since our weight loss challenge started last time i was here about a month ago i lost enough to where i thought i could wear a, 
a banana hammock out on the beach. And that's all. So I've got sunburn in places that I hadn't seen in years. Do you have pictures? Absolutely not. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God this is an audio show and not a visual show. God. Oh, keep going. You're well, the one that it looks like I'm winning. All right. Um, <laughs> According to who? I guess, since, I guess since we've gotten this far. We uh, and a reminder, everybody, we've got a weight loss challenge where we're giving to charity. Three of us are in a weight loss challenge. We picked the most ripe part of the year, which is the end of the summer, all the way through the holidays to the beginning of next year when we go back to the General Assembly session. Stop crinkling your, uh, your, your beef jerky. It's going to be snacks. a damn shame the winner of the challenge actually gains weight <laughs> that's gonna be sad right. plus two might be the uh the over under there <laughs> all right let's move on what? uh this has been great now we need to move to our turning leaning right moment senator <laughs> oh really for me yeah hey, you I, get to I go know. first i don't know if i was done with shep it's just nice to have you on nice it's to see good you to be free. back yeah you don't have an ankle bracelet on no. to monitor your i really expect whereabouts. next time you get a month off you'll come back a little bit better prepared the bruises yeah. on the wrist from the handcuffs have gone good i i see you have no notes usually you're super prepared not prepared well you know the boy uh, i kind of fell job. out i mean I, i'm not getting updates anymore well, i don't even know who we're I, I just don't know anymore. boyd kept your job I mean, when you came back you still had a job right? i still have a job how's boyd doing Boyd is doing great. Why don't you give them a plug? And there, think, not the general deserves a plug. Thank Brandon Boyd for letting me come over here and waste eight hours a week with y'all guys doing this. He's very generous with his time. Wait, a very small generous. Yeah, a little waste. small delicate. <laughs> waste. Yeah. But then bitches when we don't include him on maybe a week or two. Yeah, yeah. well, you know. Okay. My All feelings right. got hurt. I, I think this is a different kind of ship. It is. A little you? sensitive. Yeah, yeah, not so yeah. free-flowing. My feelings got hurt. A little protective, little... little Right. In. I got right, let me ask one more question. We'll try to <laughs> squeeze something out of this <laughs> shit pie we got here. Uh, what, what are you anticipating or what are you, you know, the next meeting, what are you thinking that's going to happen? What kind of drama can we expect? What is your position on things? What are you trying to, you know, what, 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 what's the plan? Well, my plan is to present counsel with a transcript of the last two meetings showing all of the, uh, inconsistencies and misrepresentations made by council members, and I hope that that will, I'm going to ask for somebody's job. Who? The citizens have been uh, lied to, employees are, are given misrepresentations to elected officials, and I just don't, uh, I'm just not good with giving them a free pass on this. I've been personally attacked as an elected official by other officials, I've been lied to by town staff uh -huh. i can prove it and i aim to prove it oh so the attack becomes the attacker correct the aggressed upon becomes the aggressor well it's kind of what's going on in america the right now becomes the shepherd hmm. well that vacation really worked for you didn't yeah, it? you damn you right re-energized didn't you, re didn't you? <laughs> that must not have been just from a drink what was that thing called again sex no <laughs> drink <laughs> <laughs> Miami Vice. <laughs> We've really got to decide. Married Senator. sex. <laughs> We've really got to decide, Senator. What kind of podcast are we doing here? <laughs> and the senator has left the building. <laughs> We've lost one. We're down a man. Yeah. Man down. I bet y'all send me notes next time. Man down. <laughs> you know what the what the audience doesn't know is there's about ten minutes of us having a discourse where Herman just kept saying, Can you hit stop and start over? And now we are. This is a good time far, for me to say that Pace of is an entertainment stop company this one. which develops gaming software that players <laughs> love to play and can use their skills to win every single time. Pace of is focused on people having fun, the small businesses that love them, and can generate can generate senator Sex? millions of dollars <laughs> in virginia good family tax revenue good yeah. family company well <laughs> you know they should start serving these drinks the miami vice right next to their machines it would be perfect i think it's a perfect way of going now pace max great we love them uh, we're very appreciative of what they do here in the commonwealth of virginia and all throughout the country giving small businesses opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have to engage in a marketplace outside of what they're used to, you know, in convenience stores and truck stops. And, I'll and tell all. you what you do. You get Carl, Carl, your cousin, right, the bartender at Fo Show, mm -hmm. to make the Miami Vices, he will make enough in tips to pay the penalty on his water bill in South Hill. Okay. True story. 
He got a penalty. Why am I asking? But I'm going to do it. He got a penalty on his water bill? I have no idea. Obviously, Shep knows something <laughs> you know. You got a penalty? Or everybody get a penalty? Now we got a HIPAA violation. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's health. The same thing. It's going to be somebody's health. <laughs> My God, you're right. This is a shit show. Well, and, <laughs> and, and newsflash, it's just going to get worse. <laughs> well, we're going to have to take a break. Because you just blended worse. another one. Mm-hmm. So, so part of what we're doing here in my leaning right moment is always brought to you by... Oh, shit. Oh, who gives a shit at this point? <laughs> <laughs> just Shep's vacation. We'll just say yeah. that brought... Uh, but it's Charlie's Waterfront Cafe, the tasting room in all Farmville, Virginia, the bakery. Great guys, great man, great restaurant. Go visit it. I can't really give a full-throated endorsement right now because I'm just still thinking about what... Now that you're back, Shep, I'm just totally uh, flummoxed. But we just got back. We, we are not, like I said earlier, uh, because of a flood at my office. We're in a hotel room sitting at... Uh, which is a headache so bad. Apartment, <laughs> sitting at the bar. Uh, oh, which damn, is migraine. Not at the bar at the restaurant. We're sitting at, in my kitchen. And uh, we had a long day in the Virginia General Assembly. A called day. We all were called back. Hopefully we're taking care of, this, uh, the, of judges, doing all this stuff. And we did absolutely nothing today except bitch at each other. Mm. So another wasted day of the taxpayer money. Uh, Why then, is that? Well, I think Democrats were more interested in, in trying to uh, flog our governor for going to the state of Maine for a governor, a Republican governor, to help his reelection efforts. They don't like the guy because he made some crazy statement some one day or other. I think they're kind of jealous because Governor Northam was never asked to go help to go people anywhere. campaign, <laughs> especially after his you know hooded thing and his blackface. Uh, uh, but they took their opportunity to say he was out of town while we were here doing this, the people's business. Well, we weren't doing anybody's business. We weren't. We were not doing much of anything. We, we agreed to four judges, two in my old district, two in Loudoun County. Um, we had some debates that didn't have to happen. We sat around a lot and we wasted a lot of time. And so by the time I got back here, we went in at noon and we got back here, what, four-ish? Um, I just felt like those were one of those days when government did not perform its function. And the funny thing is, is for all you guys that, that watch Virginia politics, the House of Delegates adjourned what we call signy die, which means adjourn forever, adjourn the special session. The Senate went out in recess. We adjourned in recess to be called back within 48 hours. So the question is, usually when we end the sessions, we form the body up every time. We dissolve our legislature every year. Form them up by resolution, by agreement by each chamber, and then we enact rules and laws that we agree to work within. Gotcha. We're in a special session. We're not in general session. We had a resolution of agreeing to, to come together. The House just adjourned basically saying it's over it's the kill switch in the senate we just said oh we'll be back on 48 hour call from the rules chairman the question now becomes are we adjourned and dissolved or are we still there because the senate says we're still a body the house says we're not but why is that important because if we're adjourned signing die if there are any appointments that need to be made the governor can make them outside of the legislature without their approval so that's a very powerful tool for a governor to have. Let's say one of our senators running for Congress wins. Well, a special election would have to be called. If we're still in session, the chairman of the Rules Committee for the Senate would call the election. If we're adjourned, the governor calls the election. If the Democrats are smart and a, a senator that we have, Senator Kagan's, probably going to be Elaine Luria out there at Virginia Beach for Congress, if she wins... We would want that election. The governor would want that election called the day after, as mine, when I when Robert Hurt won and I ran for Robert's seat, was called the next day so that that member would replace the outgoing senator who's now a congressman elect, congressperson elect, congresswoman elect, the day session began in 2023. What would the Democrats do to hold their majority, make sure that they had maybe more power? And if the chairman of the rules committee, who's a Democrat, would be able to call the election because we're still in session, they would probably call that election to happen in February or at the end of next year's session. To get you through the session with We majority. would be down at 20, 2118. They would have even more power. So it's a chess match going on. It's an interesting constitutional question that has never been answered because four or five years ago, when the House was 
Republican majority and the Senate was Democrat majority, much like it is before. I guess it was five, six years ago. We adjourned sine die in the Senate like the House did and the House stayed in. But the, now the senators who are saying, who are in control, the Democrat senators, Dick Sasslow, the bunch, are saying, oh, we're still in session. We're the ones, when we adjourn sine die over our objection, we're saying session's over. We dissolved. So now, funny how the... The flip-flop. Yeah. Funny how up is down, left is right. Oh, yeah. Green is yellow. And that reminds me. A part of what I'm doing and leaning right is always making sure we point out that hypocrisy. I mean, gentlemen, you're seeing it now. The old guard says, I might have said A before, but now it's B, and I never said A. We've seen with the Democrats, Hermie, we've seen a lot of times where, you know, now they're now if you look at the news, they're saying, yeah, those schools being closed down, that was all Republicans. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, yeah, everything that, you know, that was caused, that was bad because of the pandemic was caused by Republicans. When we were saying, don't shut down, don't shut down the schools. Oh, those bad test scores. Republican. We have a we have a we have a revisionist president who has the gall to walk out and say and have his press secretary say, We've never contested elections. Are you kidding me? It's always the Republicans. And for them to contest an election in January sixth shows how dangerous, how abusive they are to the Constitution. And so Hermie, you and I were talking about when Shep was still in jail, or the Bahamas, I can't remember. Um about we were having that discussion that Biden was going to have this speech to reunite America, to reunite, to to galvanize the soul. That's one of the things he ran on was forget policy. Trump was, in their view, a divider. Sure. Yep. Biden comes in, policies aside, because we've learned now, you know, two years later, the policies are atrocious. If you're living in the real world and have a job or raising a family or doing all those kind of things. But they try to come in and say, Biden is running on unity. I'm going to unify the nation. Yeah. And so now every time they are. And he's always angry and scowling when he's talking. Yeah. Well, if you heard the speech now, it's because he can't read the teleprompter. Well, not only that. I mean, it's just if you saw the speech because it was not carried by all of the stations in fact i had to i was in my rv and we'll talk about that with carter at my new rv we have a little story there in his probably your turning left moment i couldn't really find it just like i couldn't find the nascar race that week but i finally found where it was he's in a blood red backdrop at the place where the declaration of independence the constitution the, the forming documents of our of our country were founded he's got in the dark background marines in uniform, a complete misuse of our military for a political speech. Correct. That's supposed to unite America. He's got the Marine Corps band playing Hail to the Chief in a captive audience. And instead of saying, we need to unite, instead of saying, you know, I made some mistakes. This is how we're going to do this together. I'm going to listen to you guys. He made some of the most outrageous, divisive, and dangerous statements I've ever heard an American president make. And I've heard presidents, Trump, Obama, Bush, not first George Bush, he wasn't divisive at all. I mean, Reagan was inspirational, but it's becoming more divisive. It's becoming more polarized in what they say. But I've never heard something like this. And, and Brad has a couple cuts, and so I just want to talk about these guys if, if we can, because it worries me. It worries me because now we are actually seeing someone with a differing view, according to the Democrats in control, who we've talked about are using, weaponizing the instruments of government against their opponents. And rather than lowering the temperature, even after they searched Donald Trump's residence for these supposed classified documents, our American president steps out in front of this austere building that represents so much to us and says the following. These are hard things, but I'm an American president not a president of red America, blue America, but of all America. And I believe it's my duty, my duty to level with you, to tell the truth, no matter how difficult, no matter how painful. And here, in my view, is what is true. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. Bullshit. 
They do not believe in the rule of law. They do not recognize the will of the people. Double bullshit. They refuse to accept the results of a free election. Unbelievable. And they're working right now, as I speak, in state after state, to give power to decide elections in America to partisans and cronies, empowering election deniers to undermine democracy itself. Now, wow, that's your first cut. That's just about our elections. These are the guys now no one can contest, except unless you're the press secretary for the president. That do you remember when George Bush and Al Gore, George Bush, the son, and Al Gore ran? Remember that? Yes. The elongated election process? Yes. Because of Florida. Right, but not just Florida. Did the Democrats ever mm -hmm. accept that that was a legitimate Never. election after all the votes were counted? All the Chads, sorry, Never. Chad, all the Chads, the hanging Chads were counted. The determination was that George Bush was the winner. Did the Democrats ever accept that? Never. Never, ever. Never. Never. Now, they accepted when Barack Obama won, right? And did you hear any contest between the Republicans? That Barack Obama did not win the presidencies. No. They haven't even accepted the election down in Georgia. We're getting to that. Yeah. You're exactly right. They haven't even accepted that. Shep, you're exactly right. So then, did they ever accept that Donald Trump won the election in 2016? 16. No. No. Because it was a Russian collusion. It was collusion. There were these things. Everything was... They've never accepted a Republican election going all the way back to George W. Bush. They've always contested elections. That's their game. And what? Kemp in Georgia? With Stacey Abrams? Stacey Abrams. They're yeah. still saying that was bull. That it was, that was stolen elections. Stolen elections. She's going to run again. Right. They're, his... his press secretary comes out and even says oh well that's different it's the same damn thing but w what does our president say MAGA Republicans they're out there conniving conspiring to steal an election why by not allowing the voter drop boxes that we found are highly <laughs> highly abused by make voting the way it should be which is show your ID go vote show well, your ID to get on a plane show your ID to buy beer no, that's god awful. That's ridiculous. But we're we're the bad guys. But they're the ones that have denied elections, except their own, as being legitimate. Actually, I got on a plane through a suitcase, but we won't talk about that. I didn't have to show my ID. <laughs> you were inside a suitcase. Yeah, <laughs> I was on a no-fly list. <laughs> Lord have mercy. What the hell? You got another clip you want to play? Yeah, I got one more. Too much of what's happening in our country today is not normal. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Now, I want to be very clear, very clear up front. <clears throat> not every Republican, not even the majority of Republicans are MAGA Republicans. Not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. I know because I've been able to work with these mainstream Republicans. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. So Biden goes on to say that MAGA Republicans are the enemy of the state. MAGA Republicans foment violence and insurrection. MAGA Republicans are the reason why our country is screwed. MAGA Republicans are the reason why inflation is inflation. MAGA Republicans are responsible for everything. Every time a volcano erupts, it's because a MAGA Republican did it, according to Joe Biden. And yet, to deflect high inflation, a souring economy, stagflation, violence in the streets caused by these riots that we saw, Energy prices. Energy prices on a failed green agenda. It's MAGA Republicans. Some of the worst people in the world. I mean, the most divisive things you're ever going to see in the world to say that we... So are you a MAGA Republican if you're pro-life? Well, the answer would be because he only says the only... And it's not every Republican because if it's like Lynn Cheney, I can work with her. But if you're pro-life, you're a MAGA Republican. If you believe in closed borders... 
in securing our borders and keeping our people safe and having our laws obeyed. You're a MAGA Republican. If you don't believe in defunding the police, you're a MAGA Republican, so you're an enemy of the state. If you don't believe in letting murderers out on bail while their charges are pending, you're a MAGA Republican. You're the enemy of the state. And what does, what does any government do when they're in control when you determine 47 million people who voted for Trump, half of America or maybe more, are the enemy of the state? Rebel. Well, what the government does is it controls them by arresting them, by searching their homes, by making examples out of people. Hmm. You ever seen that happen before? Mar-a-Lago. Did you this see... Is, this is a desperate time in America. Did you see the And we're probably in trouble or being surveilled... <laughs> right now. Because of what we say, maybe. Because you, what's next? That's a, that's a banana republic. Did you see the commercial Trump put together with... He just did a rally not too long ago since mar a They put up on social media it was a, a commercial Trump did with his rally with... 50,000 screaming people yeah. there. And then they show Biden's... Screaming USA, yeah. USA. And they show Biden's you know, speech that we just played some clips from. And it's like 50 people there. It's like being in a mortuary. Yeah. 50 is being generous. It, or, probably being Or even generous. on uh, Labor Day when he went to a union you know, it's just in Detroit. Horrible. And there's no more than 30 people in a park. It's just horrible. Yeah, it's just but, horrible. But see, that's called mob rule. That's the minority taking over the majority. Correct. That's the thing that our, that our founding fathers said... Be most careful of. Be wary. We put the power in men, but by the power who, 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 of these men who hold the power means they should be trusted the least and not given so much that they have the power over the people. What we're seeing, what we're seeing is a desperate act. Look, this president is scared shitless that Donald Trump's going to run against him because actually Donald Trump probably win or, or DeSantis. They are scared to death that they're going to lose the power that they have over the FBI, CIA, over our media. And all these pieces are playing in the, in the position to favor one of the worst presidents we've ever had in the United States history. It makes Jimmy Carter look like a statesman. Should but I don't know if they ever Rushmore. lost control of that when Trump was president. No. Because no, look at what those organizations did. That was the deep state swamp. The deep state. Turns you out know. it's all right. And, but, but if you're the son of a corrupt president... Oh, you get a free pass. pass. Oh, my God. You get a free pass. But if Donald Trump Jr. ever, you know, had hookers on on a uh, thumb drive, snorting cocaine off their body parts, smoking crack, making deals with the big guy and Chinese development companies, do you think Donald Trump Jr. would ever have survived for a minute? He'd had to go to Nassau. No. But here's what we're saying. And here's what we're seeing. Within 60 days, the body politic may be losing authority through at least one chamber or both chambers to run as they want the co country to be run, which is to their corrupt benefit. And so what, is, what does our president come out and do? He comes out swinging saying, you, if you're conservative in any way, in any one of these policies that disagree, maybe you believe that a man is a man and a woman is a woman and we shouldn't be mutilating our kids with transgender ideologies, that we should allow parents to have the final say on teaching our children what they teach them. As I've said with Hermie and I when we've had this discussion, it, a, a school or a teacher should ne never teach your child what to think. They should merely che teach them how to think, not what to think. Right and here now, we are. Right now, the things we're talking about, and we had some fun joking about it, but we, we're talking about people being drunk on power and trying to control the narrative to people yes. and what they want you to know. Shep is fighting that on the local level. The things that Senator Stanley just talked about, we're talking about on the national level, how people try to control the narrative or try to keep their people in places of power and these kind of things. And Senator, I want to talk to you about something that really, to me, comes back to the state level. We have talked on this podcast many, many times about the possibility that I may run for Senate. And I plan to make an announcement in that regard on November the 9th. And so as we're sitting here taping, I've made no announcements, really no decisions. I plan to do that November the 9th. Well, I've got people reaching out to me, Senator, 
that have or are involved in statewide politics. They may be lobbyists. They may even be lobbyists for casinos and other things that are already talking about how can they use their money and power and influence to maybe support other candidates or put other candidates up and support them to potentially either persuade me not to run or to try to fund somebody to, to beat me if I were to run because they know that I, if I come in, I'm going to be pushing for transparency and people's rights, the rights of small businesses, the free market system, capitalism, all these things that they want to try to squash. And you don't need their money to do that. I don't. You don't need it. But people are, I mean, it's, to me, it just, it's, it's mind-blowing to me that people that are actually coming up with, you know, talking about the possibility of, well, we can't make Hermie not run necessarily, but we sure can support these candidates or put money up or try to do something to get somebody else to win because, Lord have mercy, if Hermie Sadler and Bill Stanley get side by side in the Senate of Virginia, how are we going to pull the wool, wool over all these people's eyes? Yeah. Does that, I mean, well, yeah. that, that's... I'm seeing it you too. may or may not be seeing it too. No, I'm seeing it too. In fact, when I'm up here, I have friends that I've made, friends that I knew that are in, in the lobby game um, who I just want to come to my event, enjoy some time with me. I'm having a fundraiser at a racetrack. Come on up. Let's hang out. They know my wife. They've spent time at my house. We've gone fishing. We've gone hunting outside the political realm. And they've got other clients. You know, no lobbyist just has one client usually. And they've said, well, I don't know if I can come because, you know, you guys have been filing subpoenas and discovery requests for some of my clients who may be associated with casinos. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Okay. All right. You got to choose the check, choose the check. But I guess you find out how this really is. You know, you're here for a time. But the system, the system stays the same. So if you and I, you know, if we started out this lawsuit for skill games, for little small businesses fighting to survive, um, on a conversation, it was the two of us. And they That's never right. took us serious. That's right. Never took us seriously. Always thought this was a big joke. Oh, you guys go over and have your fun. And then we win. And then what you become is not, okay, maybe let's fight fair. You become an enemy of the state or at least the status this new big industry that's come in is now targeting you. You must boycott Bill Stanley's re-election campaign, or you can't go to his event if you still want us to have you as our client. You know, you're our, you are our lobbyist. What, what the hell is that? You know, so now, is the state of Virginia the legislature going to be run by outside, outside state interests in casinos or some other big industry? Because we're more worried as either a legislator to the check we might get at a fundraiser or the lobbyist who really like, and I don't mean this against them, but like cockroaches, they're around forever. You know, I mean, we come and go, but lobbyists stay forever and they do direct policy. Let's not be naive about this. They educate us sometimes in areas that we don't have the education so we can make our decisions. Sometimes we agree with them. Sometimes we don't. They, that creates a lot of power, but the power, they're like a conduit between this industry this new industry that's coming into virginia now that they've opened the door they barged all the way through and man they're going to control everything including a small business a vfw a charitable gaming place and now down to the point where gee bill uh I, i'd love to talk to you but i can't be seen near you because one of my clients might fire me the big bad casino lobby because you filed some subpoenas asking for some information from these clients in a fight for small businesses hermes but others and I'll tell you, because, you know, we talk honestly and openly about this. You looked at me and said, the more I look at this, the more it disgusts me. Yeah. Yeah. But that's almost, in my mind, a reason, more of a reason, more of a reason why we have a Shep Moss at the local level, more of a reason why we need a Hermie Sadler, not some 20-year or 30-year or 10-year politician that has just gotten so cozy with what they do. That all they want to do is what the bidding is by whomever has given them the biggest check or what they're afraid of. I told you. Who would be afraid of small business? Who would not be on the side of small business? Look, Who would say, I don't care about the convenience store. I care about Bally's 
or Caesar's. It's I mind blowing. It. I told you the other day. I don't get it. I said, "Is the more I have learned, the more I don't like." That's what. You but said. I told you the other day. As mad as it made me for somebody to insinuate to me that people, you know, we're fighting for small business. We are fighting against a law that so far we have been proving in court that is unconstitutional, not even to mention unethical to give casinos a monopoly to come operate in the Commonwealth of Virginia. They don't need a damn monopoly. Super monopoly. Not they're already, a monopoly. They're already starting the game on second base to right. start with. Yeah. They don't need a home run. They got go. the backs. They, they got plenty of advantages. They have as the best tax and regulation scheme. The government just handed it to them. Gave so away. we have gone to court so far, and a judge has said, "You know what? This law is unconstitutional for these reasons. This is a free speech issue because of what this does. This is a violation of this because this does." So we have triggered this. So now these lobbyists are saying, "Forget them coming to the table and trying to have a conversation with us about." what we're really fighting for let's get on the same team and fairly tax and regulate small businesses so we can operate let the casinos operate let rosie's operate everybody's happy everybody's happy but no they are mad at us because we are bringing these issues to light and we are a roadblock to them to get what they think is rightfully theirs as a monopoly. But I told Bill, I said, this guy... Not just a monopoly, total domination. Total domination. So when they first tell me this, I'm like, this is man, crazy. that really that, that is crazy. But then after I sleep on it for a couple hours, I get up and I, I text Bill at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I said, the fact that we've got lobbyists for the casino interest, out-of-state casino interest, that are so mad at you that they would blackball attending your event as a 11 year honorable member of the general assembly. And they would now tease the fact or want to, they tell people that they know will tell me, sadly, if you're thinking about running, we're going to throw piles of money at somebody else to get you out of the picture. The fact that we've done this to these lobbyists and they want to come after me like that makes me realize even more that what we're fighting for is worth it. Is worth it. You know, my boss, Amen, brother. you know, my boss, Brandon Boyd, I always have conversations with him because now it's not my business. It's his business. And I always have conversations, Brandon, you know, things at the town hall are getting a little hot. I'm catching some heat, you know, allegations are flying around. I don't want my actions to affect your business. I'm always very mindful of that. So the other day, just yesterday, actually, he told me, he said, Shep, the reason I allow you to do this is because I know you are fighting to keep the doors over there on those hinges open. And we've got to have people like you at the local level to do this. We've got to have people yeah. like Hermie, hopefully, at, this, at the state level. Yeah. The listeners have got to get involved. Why do you think they want to charge me with trespassing and, and, and theft of, of town property, which was... They just declared trash because they know that I'm uncovering what's going on. The lobbyists know that you are a legitimate threat. And this law case, this lawsuit is a real issue. Human Ain't. complacency. Human complacency on the level of the citizen allows the others to rush in, to create the rules, to create the curtain, to hide behind. Yes. And until that curtain is ripped away, then they live in this world that they've created for themselves. And it's like I've said before, my dad, you say, when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. They turn around and go, see, this is great. When in fact, it's corrupted. And we've allowed it to happen because we've been sitting on our hands, just wanting to be left alone. I want to make, I got my acreage. I got my job. I got my family. Just leave me the F alone. Well, that complacency has allowed this rust, these barnacles to be on the bottom of this ship we call a free society and it's detrimental to us the all. frustrating thing for them is that they tried to get to you senator stanley yes. at the very beginning of the process before these casinos came in and you decided hey let the ship go where it's going but you i'm i'm not i don't you you can't pay me to to, to vote Sink for you. That's not what businesses. I believe in. Yeah. But hey, majority rules. Yeah. And I will say this. I'll say two things. One thing 
The second thing I probably shouldn't bring up, but I am. Shit on it. <laughs> I'm not telling you anything anymore. <laughs> the uh, the first thing on this show. <laughs> the first thing is I'll re- I'll remind people. We are not in any way telling the casinos they can't come in and build their shiny new buildings and do all their great business. They won. They got not the referendums. They got they the, got the referendums. They win. Deal. Rosie's is coming to Emporia in my backyard, I'm sure, to prove a point to me. That's great. But we need to have a level playing field for all small businesses to compete. The first line of the Republican creed of Virginia talks about the importance of the free market system awarding casinos a the monopoly. monopoly because they have money, power, and influence. Newsflash is not following the free market system. Okay? But I'll say, I had a guy come up to me the other day. As I said, even though I haven't even made a decision or an announcement or anything about running for office. Guy comes up to me the other day and says, because if I do decide to run, there'll be a primary with Emily Brewer. Sure. Delegate Brewer from Suffolk. Guy comes up to me and says, in fact, he's at the Isla White uh, committee meeting that I'm speaking at that is really Delegate Brewer's hometown, sure. whatever the case may be. We talked about it a little bit, uh, I think, on, on a, one of the prior podcasts when I was speaking at this Isla White uh, committee meeting that it was clear to everybody there that Delegate Brewer's people had planted some people in the audience to ask me some questions about monies that I donated or my business donated or that I personally donated or you know, emails between myself and Louise Lucas who has been the only legislator that I've had the opportunity. She's the only person I can talk to about policy in the county that I live in for the last 20 years. She's, she's, she's your representative. Else. So, you know, whatever. But this person came, comes up to me and says, well, why wouldn't you just support Emily Brewer? You don't think she can do the job? And I say, I don't know. And here's why, here's, here's why I don't know. Because, as we've documented on this podcast, Senator Stanley and our team have proven SB 971 is unconstitutional. So now, the next thing they've done to take another swing at small business is insert this new policy language into the state budget. Well... Which is not best business practice at Especially all. Especially when there's ongoing litigation. Correct. They're really giving the thumbs up to the judge and the whole judicial system. Absolutely. By doing this. But Delegate Brewer was one of the conferees on this appropriations committee. Hmm. She was one of the ones that this language got inserted, and she was a conferee on this committee. So okay. Through her committee. Through her committee. So, could she have stopped it from happening? Maybe not. But I didn't see anywhere where she raised hell about it no or fight. brought attention to it and said, hey, other people on the appropriations committee, I've got a bunch of small businesses in Suffolk and Isle of Wight in the areas that I represent that banning these games is really going to hurt them. Didn't hear it. Didn't see it. Don't know if it exists. But if you look back, as I've been told to do, Senator, what is the website you can go online and look at people that, who they took donations from? Uh, it's VPAP. VPAP. VPAP.org. If, VPAP. if you go to VPAP and search Emily Brewer, you will see that she accepted money from three different casino interests. Wow. Okay. So if I'm going to allow her to trust that she's going to do the right thing. Do I know that those uh, donations influenced her to be quiet? I don't know. But I can tell you if I was there, 
I may not have been able to stop the ship. You would have spoken out I against it. But I guarantee it, I'm going to stand up on the floor or in yep. that meeting and tell everybody this is not right and this is why. Make sure everybody knows where you stand, where I stand on this because I got to go back and talk to these people in my district, these small business owners at these restaurants and convenience stores. Now, maybe at some point in time, Delegate Brule will decide to, to do that, to address that. But right now, all I can tell you is, because that's all I know, is this language went through this appropriations committee, and she was a conferee. And I don't see anywhere, haven't been able to see anywhere, where she stood up and spoke on it. Maybe she doesn't oppose it. I don't know what her position is. But so my, I didn't say all this to that guy that night because I'm trying to be the old, be nice to a fellow sure. Republican. Professional courtesy. Professional courtesy. But if somebody's going to question me, then I think it's fair to question her. Well, and you know, if you do that, that Senator, you, you may or may not want to comment no, on any no, of that. That's the truth. But if you do how, that as how, an elected, how can you comment against the truth? Really? If, if you do that as an elected well official, said. if you stand up on the floor, you plead your case, you make it known, even if you lose the vote, yeah. you've done your job. You can go back and answer to well, your constituents. Well, well, remember, this is the tip of the spear, though. You know, we have 140 people in the legislature. Five to ten are conferees on the budget. One of the most powerful bills that comes through the House and Senate on each side. Uh, if you're standing up for a principled matter, maybe sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But you go out there and say, man, I fought against it, but I lost. That's right. Uh, I guess That's what he's saying is not heard that. None of us have heard that. What we have heard from a lot of and even future guests are coming up on this podcast is I was forced to vote on something that was the budget as a whole not individually on some of the procedural and policy decisions that were made, including legislating through the budget on this new definition of what a skill game was, which now we have to relitigate coming in November, um, which I think is just as bad, just as silly, but is because we then have this now to fight. We had the other case won, So we started over, started to file discovery motions, filed discovery requests, filed subpoenas for records, from parties and non-parties, because this language was brought in. It wasn't one of these legislators said, man, I know how to change the criminal code on my own through the budget. I'm going to write this, this, and this. The outside interests, casino interests, and their multi, multi-million dollar law firms decided they were going to write this language and insert it in the criminal code without vetting, without proper procedure, without sunlight, transparency, without debate on the floor, without public talking about it. They did it through the back door, but they couldn't get through the front door. And then they're appalled, appalled that we would fight because they never thought we'd win. Now, when we won, we became more dangerous. So they were going to they were going to be more corruptible, more dangerous to to our free society and write things into the budget the wrong way. And then how dare we fight? Well, you're going to pay a price for fighting. Well, here's the. Because you're not going along. We're talking about these. The we're talking about lobbyists. Hey, look, they got a job to do and family sure. to feed, just like I do. But the assumption is, just by the way they act when they don't get their way, the assumption is, if they bring a legislator a check, they expect to get some consideration. That's why you turn a lot of those monies down. Consideration comes in many forms. One is attention, sure, time, sure. Let us make us pitch. Uh, sometimes, though, you know, when they look at you and like, hmm, and you say, "Look, I can't support this." A lot of a lot of the really good ones, and even the one I was talking about earlier, yeah. understands. That's fine, and it doesn't change. But some of them are like, no. And on the converse, uh, conversely, there are legislators, unnamed, will not say, who basically say, "You want me to vote this certain way? I gotta, I gotta see something in my donation box." Sure. sure. Seriously, the wrongest of the wrong. You know, I used to make this joke. You know. Uh, in, in politics, I said, man, I can't be bought, but I can be rented. And that's a joke. But you see it. You know, I don't live my life that way. I'm, I'm going to stick with my principles. Maybe I'll agree with you. Maybe I won't. It doesn't matter whether you've donated or not. But there's a lot that think if I do, if I do A, if I pay, make a donation, I'll get B. There's a lot then on the other side that says, well, if you want even some time in my office, for me to vote for the stuff, you got to fill my coffers. That is the destruction of the democracy. We're it's the a whole democracy. process. We're a republic as a nation, but a democracy, you know, but not a mob rule democracy, a democratic system form of government. 
And that's where we corrode from the top. My daddy used to always say, a fish rots at the head first. And I see it here in politics, state, national, and local level. You're seeing it more than anywhere else. And, and aside from all that, this new 17th senatorial district, it is my opinion, like you teach me how to say, <laughs> in my opinion, we have been really underrepresented, especially on the Senate side. So we have not had enough representation, nobody to bring attention to and stand up for the needs of our area. So I just bring that up because, it, you know, I get kind of questioned. Louise Lucas has been the senator that has represented my district for 20 years. If I want to get my voice heard on something or try to get her consideration, I've never given Louise Lucas one penny. But if I have something I want to give to her or get, you know, Louise, think about this. Think about what you're doing with minimum wage. Think about what you're doing with raising fuel taxes and gas taxes. And then I go speak at a committee meeting and I want to get questioned on, somebody wants to question me on, well, what kind of relationship you got with Louise Lucas? If that's what I'm going to get, then it's fair to ask who I may be running against. Sure. Would you get, would you get in exchange for these casinos throwing your little cash? Did you turn the other the cheek on the on this well, you know. and the simpler question is why did you pick big out of state casinos over small businesses in your district especially that when was the measure south side virginia is full today of small businesses that are struggling ain't no damn casino right now in, the, in that district no and so it makes you question i don't have any i don't know it may not be anything to it but i know when this stuff gets in here and then i follow back up like i was told to do you know, let's let's talk about really who's getting the money from where and what decisions they Things didn't make. make you go, hmm. So, so let me ask best, you something. The best leading right moment I think <clears throat> let me I've ask had you something. in, what, 36, 37 episodes? Let me ask you something. And, and you won't know the answer. But how many people in the General Assembly do you know of that are small business operators? Hmm, great question. And the reason I ask, because you're not going to know the number. I get that. No, no, about 35, 40 percent. Okay. So the majority does not know what retired it, or other work for biz, big business. So they don't understand what it means and what it takes to live from the cash register having to ring. Absolutely correct. They just don't under and, and look. Absolutely and I have it, right. I have and, it or paycheck to paycheck or you just made payroll, but you ain't taking anything yeah. home and you're making spaghetti for you know, the kids. In this last which I've done election cycle in South Hill, we were able to get a few business people on council i hope we have some more coming in november it's got to be a balance i don't think it should be all small business no. representation no, no. it's got to be a balance eliminate lawyers you need the kind of collection but if these people don't know what hermes businesses are going through and all of these other small businesses that he's trying to help protect if they don't understand what they're going through they have no idea of what they're voting on Shep, how the ramifications no are. they don't have that perspective they just a don't lot have of people it. in the Senate are older people, retired people, got a big paycheck. Um, a lot of them work for big companies. Um, and I want to say one they thing. They don't get it. I mean, they don't get it. A lot of them don't. I mean, I'm a small business owner. My wife is a small business sure. owner. Sure. Uh, we know what it's like. Hermie's a small business owner. He knows what it's like. But others, you should see, they're like, we need to get out of here because I got to catch a plane to my house in Barbados. Not a three day vacation, dude, or Hawaii. Six months. I apologize if I brought up something or said something that maybe we didn't want to talk about on Hermie, this podcast. Hermie, that's that's why we never this is real, anything. brother. But I only brought that up or got that out there or got it off my chest because simply stated, I believe in doing everything the right way. Yeah. And I don't believe in throwing darts at somebody. I believe eventually the truth will come out and people will learn. But if you poke me, I'm going to poke back. You got to defend yourself. I'm going to defend myself. And it, it's always going to be that way. <laughs> well, I tell you what, this is a great leaning right moment. I think what we should do is probably, are, are we done here? I mean, have we hit well, all the Well, just say one more time, we have to encourage these listeners to get out, get involved, run for the school board, run for the Open board of supervisors, see what's going on, run for your town you council, right. become a delegate, become a senator, do something to get involved. Yeah. Even if you don't want to hold the position, Go to the meetings, have your voice heard, 
and watch what's going on. Support the right candidate or decide you want to be that candidate. Mm-hmm. Have the courage to step out in front. Because everybody can't be the candidate. No. And not everybody's, everybody's going to win. But, you know, if you have the courage to try, as my dad used to say, the worst they, thing they can say to you is no. Correct. But at least you tried. Or maybe you encouraged the next person. Or maybe you won. And now you're going to serve the people that put you there because that's what's more important than getting a big check from an out-of-state that's entity right. or from being called delegate or senator or councilman. If you're not impressed with the job but you want to do the job, if you want to make a change, make a difference, it's great. Politics is great. It, if you want to if you want to mm-hmm. gain power over people, then you're the epitome of why it right. doesn't work. I was going to say it ain't easy, but it's worth it. Uh, we want to take a break, then we'll come back and get to my – Turning left moment, which, by the way, my turning left moment is sponsored by Laura Stanley and Vista Installations. Laura has been running a successful window and door installation company and babysitting politicians for over 12 years. So, Senator, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back. I've got some kind of breaking news to get to on my turning left oh, no. More moment. <laughs> oh, no. And then <laughs> wow. later today at the end, our special guest is Hall of Fame crew chief, car owner, Innovator. Innovator, Ray Everton. We'll be right back. Wow. Hi, folks. This is Hermie Sadler. Thanks for listening to our all-new podcast, Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I hope you are enjoying the show as much as Senator Stanley and I enjoy bringing it to you. Whether you're a family traveling together or a truck driver hauling freight up and down the highway, I hope you will take the time to visit one of our Sadler Travel Plaza locations in Virginia and North Carolina. Sadler Travel Plaza locations are licensed dealer locations for pilot travel centers. And we also carry Shell Motiva Petroleum products for our four-wheel friends. We pride ourselves on providing one-stop shopping for service, food, and entertainment. Our food options include Five Guys Burgers and Fries, Quiznos, Dairy Queen, Hermie Sadler's Faux Show Bar and Grill, Victory Lane Restaurant, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Dunkin' Donuts, and much, much more. Our locations include Sadler Travel Plaza in South Hill, located off I-85 at Exit 12. The Sadler Travel Plaza of Emporia, which is conveniently located on Exit 11B off I-95. And Sadler Travel Plaza on Highway 58 in Suffolk. We also have our North Carolina location, Sadler Travel Plaza in Dunn, North Carolina. That's Exit 75 off I-95. We appreciate all of our customers. And Bill and I appreciate you listening to Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. Hey, this is Bill Stanley, Hermie Sadler's sidekick on this podcast. When I'm not in Richmond at the Capitol or doing this podcast, my real job for the past 27 years is as a trial attorney with the Stanley Law Group. Here at the Stanley Law Group, we represent our clients in every courthouse in the Commonwealth. No problem is too small for us to solve. No case is too big for us to win. Whether it's criminal charges, traffic offenses, civil disputes, litigation matters of any sort, we handle it all. We make sure that we treat every client like family because they are to us. Your problem is our problem. Your success is our success because we hate to lose more than we love to win. And believe me, we win a lot. Don't believe me? Go ask Hermie. I'm his favorite lawyer, and he hates lawyers. So give us a call at 540-721-6028 and let us help you. Or visit our website at www.vastanleylawgroup.com. That's www.vastanleylawgroup.com. At the Stanley Law Group, we'll make sure we're the lawyers that you swear by and not at. Leaning right and turning left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. We're getting into our now turning left moment. My what a hot, moment. what a hot leaning right that just was. Yeah. We had to take a break. We had to calm down. You had me fired Don't up. Don't even get me started again. No, you know what no. I just told you outside? We took a break. Yeah. And I said, here's a synopsis of that. <laughs> you and I are standing up for the constitutional rights of people and small businesses. Mm -hmm. We have proven in court so far to be right. And the casino lobbyists, instead of being mad at the casinos for trying to bury small businesses by trying to buy themselves a monopoly. And legislators, too. Instead of being mad at them, they're mad at us. Yeah. How dare you? How dare you, Hermie Sadler? What's wrong with you? 
Well, you know what? That's why I fight. That's what my dad and my mom taught me growing up. You know, we didn't, we didn't care for bullies. I don't like bullies. And, you know, if I leave this place, when I leave this place, because everybody leaves this place at the Senate or the House, I want to know that my integrity and character were intact because those were the only things my father said to me ever mattered that you can't give away. Well, you can give them away, but you never give them back once you give them away. So good for you, Hermie Sadler, and, and, and uh, good to see you're nice and calm now. I mean, you know, these, these uh, turn and left moments seem to be just very calm compared to By what the way, my together. turning left moment is sponsored by <laughs> Laura Stanley and Vista Installations. Laura has been running a successful window and door installation company and babysitting politicians for over 12 years. Let me tell you, she was babysitting this politician as I drove from our home. Uh, we went on vacation for a week. Yeah. We haven't done that in a while. We, we got a new motor coach. As you know, in the last podcast, if you're listening, please listen to all our podcasts. Uh, we have a library where you can go back and listen. It's always very timely, but I traded in the Class C for Class A. So my first trip outside of taking it from Camping World to my house was taking it from my, well, my house, my office, the mothership, to Raleigh for two days, which was a two and a half, three hour trip, and then a two and a half hour trip to Carteret Speedway, yeah. where we stayed at an RV park just outside of Carteret Speedway on the Bogue Inlet, uh, right near Emerald Isle. Myself, my son Chandler, my wife, our two beagles from Invigo, Dixie and Daisy. And we spent a week there and it was a big difference and uh, a, a big thing. But my wife, I've learned, God bless her, uh, you know, I've got a video camera that shows exactly where I am on the right side of the road. Uh, but she she believes that I am sending us off onto the into the right side, into the cavern. She don't even need to look at that camera. No, and, and shut uh, that thing off. she she doesn't want to drive the coach, but she wants to tell me tell you that I'm not drive. driving it right. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Sure. So that was the only thing. Yeah, normal, <laughs> sure, and other things, yes. But driving it back, we were coming back. We decided to stay till Memorial Day. I mean, sorry, Labor Day. And in driving it back, we hit traffic, rain, more than a three-hour gust. Of but wind. you told me you were leaving at five a.m. Monday morning to drive home. That did not happen. So you would have missed some of the traffic well, had you. Stuck to the plan. Well, but we watched the the repeat of the Carteret race, which we participated in. Sadler Stanley Racing participated yep. in top five. Yep, and uh, and so we stayed up a little later and we enjoyed the the night that we had our last night. Had a really great time. Thanks again to Aaron Arnold uh, from Camping World. Thanks to Camping World, your guy Marcus Marcus Lamonas. Yeah, uh, I just filled out a survey. Uh, we had a great time. A, a week is about right uh, with a uh, a camper. Um, Two days is right for Hermie. Yeah. yeah, well, and, and then I have my two dogs, and so we, we'd leave and maybe go to the pool, big water slide, or we'd go, you know, do something at, at the event if we didn't take the dogs. Uh, my youngest Dixie uh, dog, the Beagle, ate a watch, uh, ate my oh. reading glasses, and ate a wow. pair of my sweet sunglasses. When I say ate, she didn't digest them. She just chewed them up and broke them apart. So she didn't take on anybody else's business. Are you, are you, are so you hijacking my turning time. left moment? No, Sounds I don't like know because we're talking about our oh. trip to Carteret Speedway, which oh. you joined us on Saturday. I and did. luckily, we did not take a car, so I was dependent on Hermie to pick us up. I drove all the way the down spot. from Emporia to Carteret County. <laughs> to take us to the race. Went Three to hours. Goose Creek uh, Camping Park and picked up. That's right. I, I really went to pick up my turning left sponsor because <laughs> she needed to be escorted uh -oh. properly in the manner she's accustomed to to the racetrack. You know, uh -oh. I was a VIP Uber. Uh, limo uber slash oh, and Chandler nice. went we had a good time very nice um and i really enjoyed going to carteret speedway because senator i think i told you this but last time i had been on that property was in the mid 1980s when i was racing go-karts how'd you do that uh not as good as my brother last time we did my brother won 10 grand then oh, wow wow uh, that's why he's really retired and i'm not <laughs> uh, he continued that practice <laughs> in nascar um but I was glad to get, you know, the Smart Series after a little summertime hiatus is, is back in business. And we yeah, got I don't a top like five. that summertime hiatus. We got to do we, something about that we, next year. Uh, we got a top five at Carteret. Now, this Saturday night. We ran at the front, but we couldn't keep yeah, it. Yeah, we, we led late. But we found out, and I may not even told you this because I told you when you started asking me questions, I needed a 48-hour morning period. Correct. <laughs> We've not but even had a debriefing on this. I, I, I'm going to debrief for you during the podcast. I was in the car. We were going back, Shep. And I kept going, okay, so what happened this day? And he just looked at me, Bill, if you were my wife, Angie, I would tell you exactly what I felt, which is to be quiet. 
but you're my friend, so I'm trying to be nice. Be quiet. I'm like, it's the same yeah, thing. I need a 48-hour mourning period when things don't go the way that I'd like for them to go. Then we can talk about it. And you don't but I did find out once we got back that, you know, we had some contact with the number seven we did. in the latter stages of the race. We found out that the left front made contact with the uh, inside retaining wall. That racetrack has a retaining wall on the inside of the corner as mm. well, and it bent the left front upper control arm. Hmm. And it put it all in a bind. They, they so it just wasn't handling good. It it, it, it yeah. damaged the car beyond uh, repair as as far as beyond being able to finish. Seven cars, the race. Tommy Baldwin's car. They weren't happy with us either. That's right. Well, that happens in short track racing. Okay. There'll be some other people we're not going to be happy with probably I mean, this we're, week. We were starting with twenty six laps or so on the outside front row. Took the lead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he always. But Johnson the car always drives really well. The ball of the story is the car was damaged uh, from a, from that accident. And that's why we were not able to to finish off a race by winning. Or I felt like we had a second or third place car. We finished fifth. Uh, I, that's you know really in all tits and purposes not bad. Phil, no, not Phil bad Stefanelli and the PSR crew always do a great job putting us together now, the best car possible. Now, now like this week, a lot this week guy. we're going to Orange County Speedway. Uh, yours truly won the last two Bush Grand National Series races at that track in 1993 and 1994. We're taking two cars. Mm. Um, we've talked about this, Senator. Um, you announced last week. Jonathan Brown, our normal driver, would be driving the 22. Uh, and one of the things I told Senator Stanley when we started and the people with Pacematic that I wanted to do, yes, we want to have the stars. We want Ryan Newman to drive, and you know, we're talking to some other NASCAR stars about driving some races, this, that, and the other. But one of the other things that was important to me was, you know, I grew up, as did my brother in the carting industry. And I'm still now very involved in the carting industry. We, we manufacture and sell premier racing chassis. One of the other things I wanted to do was give someone from the carting community, or one of my kart racers, an opportunity. So what we're doing this weekend, not only we're going to have Jonathan Brown in the 22, we're going to have Jonathan Cash, who is a well-accomplished kart racer, but also... Uh, was uh, a very he has a lot of laps at Orange County Speedway in late model stock cars uh, but he's a, he's a distributor for Premier Racing Chassis he's, his company is P&P Speed Shop down in Oxford, North Carolina we're going to give Jonathan Cash an opportunity to run in the Smart Modified Tour race this Saturday night so Saddler Stanley Racing will have two cars out there but more importantly than all that we are raising money for the family of Chris Beasley who unfortunately passed away as a result of injuries of a wreck that he had on the way home from another caught race about a month ago. The big oh, O wow. got hit by a drunk driver coming up 85. Um, mm. and Illegal immigrant. Illegal immigrant, drunk, coming down the south, coming down southbound in the northbound lane of 85. Wow. And hit Chris Beasley, who was the promoter at Capital City Speedway in Ashland, Virginia. So... Myself, as well as Senator Stanley, two or three other people that reached out on social media, we have all agreed to match whatever purse money Jonathan Cash's car, the 39 car Saturday night, whatever he wins, purse money, we're all going to match it and give that money to the family of Chris Beasley to try to help them offset some of the expenses they had, not only hospital expenses, but funeral expenses and other ways that yeah. uh, we're going to be able to do for that. So, we hope we have a big crowd of people, fans, turning out to watch the Smart Tour race on Saturday night at Orange County Speedway. Pool for the 22, but also pool for the 39 of Jonathan Cash. Hope he wins. If he wins, that'll that'll mean a, a pretty substantial uh, payday um, that, that we're all going to throw our resources together That's and awesome. do what we can to help the, the Beasley family uh, in a time of need. Absolutely. And a great cause. Yeah, great cause. And a great race. So I told you before, I might have a little bit of a special announcement yeah. to make, Senator. You know, Doesn't involve Vista Do you installations? know? No, but I do need to get one more sponsor mentioned okay. in from my sponsor of my Turning Left moment, Laura Stanley. She, you know, Did you know she runs a successful window and door installation company? I did know that. And did you know she's been babysitting politicians for over 12 years? Unfortunately, I know that as well. Okay. Yes. And, and... Politicians that think they can drive RVs right. for six and a half hours on the highways. That's right. And in bad weather. Yes. That's right. Yes. So thank you to Laura 
Stanley and Vista Installations for sponsoring yeah. the Turning Left Moment. But let me ask you a question. Mm. Shep, you may know the answer to this question, too. Just ask him then. Do uh. you do you happen to know, <laughs> Chicken, do you, you know, one of the big things that's been going on in the world of auto racing in recent months is the return, the racetrack revival to North Wilkesboro Speedway. Yes, we were just there. You won, Do you happen race? to remember who won the first race back ever at North Wilkesboro Speedway? First race since 1990. The guy with the honey wagon trying to empty out my shitter. Because <laughs> it was, was faster full. than anybody else before the first race. Because it was no? full. That wasn't the winner. Does either, either one of y'all want to take this opportunity to remind our listeners what team and driver was it? The Wood Brothers won the return to North Wilkesboro Speedway. The return. Shep, you've already got one foot in the grave after your performance today. <laughs> if you want to put both. All right, all right. All right Shep, are you Shep, talking Shep, about the this. original North Wilkesboro race? The, re- the, the question one. was, can any of you dingbats <laughs> remind our listeners who won the first race back to North Wilkesboro Speedway since 1996? Ryan Newman. In what car? The Saddler Stanley race and Pace Manic. Now, why was that so difficult? I thought you said the original race when the track opened. I'll be over here. <laughs> All right. Let's keep talking. We finally got an answer to that. Well, hell, you didn't know it either. <laughs> no, I knew it. I just passed it on to you. We got, finally got the answer to that pass to you. Okay. So, the original plan, and since we won that race, yes. the Historic. Cars Tour went and ran. Uh, they 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 ran there. Uh, Carson Quapful won that race. Dale Earnhardt Jr. finished third. Twenty yeah, some odd thousand people. Humongous oh, crowd. Awesome. Nobody other than Dale Earnhardt Jr. could have pulled that off. Yeah. So the original plan was after these couple weekends of asphalt racing, North Wilkesboro Speedway was then going to tear that track up, convert it into a dirt track for a certain period of time, like October. Run some dirt races for a couple months, then potentially repave go back it and repave it to asphalt again right well those plans have changed senator really they're not ripping up the track they announced today that barry braun said that even this was the plan barry braun's a promoter promoter that csi owns it leased the track from marcus smith he has now announced today right before we started taping this podcast that we are not going to right away pull this asphalt up and put dirt on it. So that means to me, are they going to run asphalt that races? From they now got enough October? fan response and enough fan support and enough positive reinforcement that the fans said, we love what we saw during these four or five weeks of asphalt racing. Let's try this for a while. Just keep it going. Hmm. So, we have to keep our eyes open for future announcements as it relates to what the immediate future will be for North Wilkesboro Speedway whoa, 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 whoa. because it's not going to be dirt. What, but what can those be? What would you speculate? I ha- a little birdie has told me that don't be surprised. And look, I want to say this because I want the fans to hear it because we talk about a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of podcasts talk about racing. Yep. A lot of people are racing experts and they know all this stuff really what is it boils down to and jeff hammond said this on our podcast about a month ago Mm -hmm. what marcus smith is going to be paying attention to is how many people will come sit in these stands and watch these races jeff hammond said that yes dale earnhardt jr said that you do whatever else you want to what matters is how many people show up and watch we had a full house tonight that ryan newman won for us to your point the cars tours showed up 20,000. So that my assumption is that got people looking and listening. A little birdie told me just a few minutes ago before we filmed this turning left moment filmed sponsored by, we better not be filming Laura Stanley <laughs> with this. Why are you trying to interrupt my commercials with Laura Stanley and Vista installation? Trying to be factually accurate. Here. Okay. I think there's a chance that we could see, Potentially. NASCAR's all-star race. Oh, my God. Being run at North Wilkesboro no Speedway way. maybe next year. That would be so. 
Are you kidding me? That's the best news. Now, ever. what does that mean? That means that that racetrack is going to have to undergo maybe some other renovations, maybe not the surface itself, because I think people have realized, hey, this surface provides great racing. Yeah. But maybe bathrooms, grand bleachers, stands. grandstands, safer barriers, those kind of things, which could ultimately lead to truck racing, Xfinity racing. You know, even though it's a short-term setback, because a lot of the dirt racing fans are not going to like the fact that, hey, we're not going to be able to go watch dirt racing at this track right, right now. A short-term setback could be a long-term victory for racing fans. Oh, man. Because, and, and look, nothing's been announced yet, but I think there's a chance we could be witnessing the true rebirth of North Wilkesboro Speedway and see some big time. they could get all that done by the All-Star I don't know. race? That's well, it's yeah. next May. Yeah. You got plenty of time. Yeah, but some of those skyboxes were in really disrepair. Okay, but, but instead of ripping up the track... Which is a cost. I'm not saying you have to have a skybox. I'm right. saying, okay. you know, I'm saying. But what would you rather have? Some short, tur- short track dirt racing, or would you rather be oh, able no to question. set it up for an all star race? To be honest, Xfinity or truck. You know, Marcus race? Smith SMI owns Texas and North Wilkesboro. The all star race at Texas last time was boring as shit. That's just how like it is. Right. Terrible. You know, and all the racing we saw at North Wilkesboro was. Amazing. Competitive. Very exciting. The fans showed up. And so I think this if they do this, it would be a good way for Marcus Smith to really put their money where their mouth is because the, the they say show up and support the races in North Wilkesboro. That's what's going to decide what we do. And if he comes back and now says the fans have spoken, they want racing on this old pavement yeah. at North Wilkesboro Speedway. So let's go right now, phase one. And let's fix the grandstands. Let's fix the bathrooms. Maybe ingress, egress. Let's put a safer barrier around that racetrack. And let's put the all-star race there. If they could pull all that off. That's huge. That's a win-win-win for NASCAR fans. Yeah, and they did a great job. I think they did a great job all the way through. Uh, Barry Braun needs to be congratulated. I was on the phone with him a number of times uh, helping the He also came on the racetrack and kicked us off the racetrack. I was going to say, and he has some experience. because <laughs> Can I help you? Can <laughs> Hermie and I did some laps. Uh, Hot after laps. midnight, I was a little disoriented. But Can we I help you? But yeah, we're coming off <laughs> almost to the start-finish line, and Bill, we're coming off turn two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill, yeah. It was a great night it's for turn us. Turn four. But well, the lights weren't yeah, on. Yeah, and then, and then in the morning, and, and part of why my face was so red is Hermie and I, we walked about four laps around and had a great time talking about it. But what did Barry Braun say to us when he blocked us coming off? You say turn four, but it was really turn two. Uh, we were actually leaving, and he said, Can I help you? Can I help you? <laughs> Can I help you? And he didn't look like Barry Brown because I'd never met him. Uh, and the Barry Brown I talked to on the phone didn't sound like that redneck who I thought was about to pull a gun on us and tell us to get off the track. But we walked around the track. We saw the track conditions. I think we were very surprised, you and I both. I mean, you didn't have big, huge cracks there. They had done a good job sealing some of it up. It felt like, as he had remembered, it felt like we watched the races actually happen. Tires weren't falling off really quickly. They were staying with it. Uh, the car's race was really demonstrated where... You know, late models and, and those type of cars like Xfinity cars or cup cars can run on that thing. Could you imagine, though, with NASCAR paying homage and, and, and tribute to the to the place, you know, as my dad used to always say, dance with the one that brung you, to the place that started NASCAR well, in an all-star race. And actually, how that can elevate short tracks in Virginia, North Carolina, and the history of short tracks and the future of short tracks in those rural areas that support them and the small businesses that depend on them. Man, I like this. I hope this is real. I hope this is true. And I think the smart series, I think an open wheel modified team, whatever we can do to help that. Why don't we get a big purse race, you know, $50,000, $100,000 purse race, bring down the smart, the, the modifieds from the north and the south. Have heat races, do a big dang but, thing. We could do, and you could get SRX on that track. I think next year too, if they play their cards right. This has a lot more potential than a dirt track and going out of commission for a while. And you know right. what? Ray Evernham, by the way, started the SRX series. That genius, that genius, who has been such an instrumental part of racing, started the SRX series, and that's that's something that is grabbing a lot of audience. Shep, I mean, millions of viewers on a Friday night or a weekend watching things that will be uh that will be an amazing kind of opportunity for us and hermes uh hermes telling me nascar is gonna do wheeling there well so i'm saying we- if, if they end up 
NASCAR and SMI partnering together with this racetrack, there could be some type of a partnership. But if they're going to bring modifieds back, which I would hope they would, it may be under the Wheeling right. banner because that'd be a NASCAR sanctioned. I'd event. like it under the Smart banner because that's your that's your rural guys. You tell them. Okay, give me a number. I'll make that phone call. But man, what what what, <laughs> what an opportunity though to feed off that into the smart into the smart series think, and the short tracks in North in. Carolina. No, you're going to get of, him wound of up. Of all the good news that could come from this, that's I think great for Barry Brown, for the smart series, for Dale Earnhardt Jr., for everybody involved to say, if we bring racing back to North Wilkesboro and the fans come support it, that's the best way to get racing brought back to sure. North Wilkesboro. So I look at this potentially as a real positive. Can you imagine if they could put if they if this in fact is true, and they pull all that off and they put the All Star race back at North Wilkesboro Speedway? That'd be the hottest that, ticket in NASCAR it, probably it next would year. Be, it would be big. that would be a hot ticket. It'd be big. Yeah, and it goes back to the fans supporting and coming out in yep. those big numbers. So every fan needs to really kind of say, this is where racing should be in short yep. tracks, and, and Wilkesboro is the, uh, is the Taj Mahal of that. So. And Jeff Hammond said it on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on how many successful. fans feel these stands. Y'all exactly know what? Right. I'm hungry. You want to end this? <laughs> Let me give a hand signal, my boy. Chad Monday oh, says, doing that again, it's probably about the right... We're right doing that again, Herman. Look, before, we, before, we wrap this up, this. Yeah, before we wrap this up, I want to say one more time thanks to Pacematic and remind everybody that Pacematic is an entertainment company which develops gaming software that players love to play and can use their skills to win every time. Plus, these games of skill provide vital revenue to keep family-owned businesses like bars, restaurants, convenience stores, and truck stops thriving. So could they actually have at Wilkesboro like asphalt races in the fall instead of the dirt? Like October, I think we have to wait to see what's you know, coming. Some of that, in the park. That's some of the best short track race, and especially open wheel modified in the fall when it's kind of cooler. It all started with us riding around on the golf course. Could we get track. you? Yeah, I mean, in, why stop it now? Could we get him? Could we get Hermie in an SSR car? If they had some open wheel modified open series, would you come out there and do that? Right now, I'm committed to run Hickory in the <laughs> Smart Series um, and Martinsville in the NASCAR. Women's I am series. not asking that, Mister Literal. I'm saying no, I'm, I'm telling you what I've. I know what you, you've committed to, but let's say they say, you know what, we're not going to tear it up. We think the, the track, you know, asphalt's better when it's older. So we're going to maybe run a couple more races before we close out the year and maybe work on what, he, uh, what this magic that Hermie's been talking about. And we had an opportunity to run one car or maybe two cars with Hermie Sadler. <laughs> you know oh, it's two cars. Man, it's two cars. Uh, so you know, Hermie you're Sadler. Senator, can or I, would Ray Everham. Let me, let me preface. Let would me, either one of you be let, willing to run... Let me preface. One of our cars. Let me preface. At an open wheel modified event let in the fall of this year at North Wilkesboro. Let me preface. Yes or no? What I'm Senator? Getting, can I answer? <laughs> oh, you finished the question, first of all. I think I finished. Let me preface this by saying, you know, I love you. I love you too, man. And I will always. I love you, Chef. Do my best. Oh, really? I will always I do my best. We'll to get there someday. <laughs> to respect you. Well, you take me to the Bahamas, maybe I will. <laughs> what? I'll always do my best to say everything in the most respectful way. Is that a new thing with you? It's new right this minute. I think he's teeing this one up. He's teeing but this one up. This is not going to be respectful. Let me remind you. We just had a race at North Wilkesboro a month ago and won with Ryan Newman. So why in the blankety blank would you want to take Ryan Newman out and put three calls with Hermie and Ray Everham and Paul Radford? Wow, you got it. Why wouldn't we want to put Ryan Newman back in there so and you, win? Well, her, plus, Ryan, that's plus a, that, you got to put a damn car is a great idea too with Hermie Sadler in the second car. Plus, you're going to have to put a roof panel you're, in you're to doing get his ass in the car. I, look, I you're run the race team Martin, so. financially. You do. We're 50 percent owners, but I'm responsible for the budgeting and the finances of Sadler Stanley Race. And right now, that's a lot more organized than this podcast. We, no, no. <laughs> So <laughs> F off, Shep. So I'm once the, I'm the boss of this thing and I will run your ass right out of this room. Right. And me too. <laughs> so once Manscaped, which they'll be back with us starting Manscaped October. Manscaped has made a commitment. Once they start commitment paying to off to the tune of, you know, 50 grand that it will cost to run a second car, then, then we'll talk. Seriously? When has one had to supply the money for the other? 
<laughs> Remember a few minutes ago I said how much I love you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, I, you know, and I respect you. And I, you know, it's no, wearing no, no, thing. You Every you guest you, you that we've had on this podcast. You things to me. That's what you said. Every guest we've had on this podcast, you've invited them to, to run a second or third, fourth, fifth car for SS Racing. Um, not, not some of the wrestlers. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> we can go Yet. back through and ask them. You, you offered Mickey James to, like, run the whole show. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was the one thing you agreed to. But do you know she's retiring? No. She just announced her retirement. Oh, well, look, we're trying to end this show. So we go. God love the Mad Panay. You know, I got my Mad Panay trout coming up. He keeps kicking me over here to keep her going. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> here he goes. I'm just letting <laughs> you know. He keeps kicking me. <laughs> we got Ray Everham coming up. So I got to go home with him. Well, back to Emporer. What? I got to go back to Emporer. <laughs> Emporer. Yeah. My cause in Emporer. Hey, uh, on a serious mm-hmm. note, this was a fun one. Thank you, it Senator. Was. Thank Always you, sir. To see you. Well, you know, we had a stressful day, but, but you know, that's the best thing about what we do and why we do this and why it's so fun and it's easy. You know, most people would think we, we plan this out. We don't plan this out. Um, what are you, what are you playing, Yahtzee? Um, we, we actually just do the natural things and talking yeah. to each other, and that's what makes it work. And that's why I want to thank everybody. Uh, who is always listening, spreading the news, spreading the word, giving us a five star rating song? on every modified. Start spreading the news yeah. on every uh, on every uh, platform that we have. We really appreciate that, and I appreciate you, Hermie Sadler. Why don't you sing? If you can't run a car, <laughs> same reason he's not driving a car right there. <laughs> New York, New York. Isn't that a song? Yeah, it's Frank Sinatra. Yeah, Sinatra, babe. Come on, okay. man. All right. Now, I'm the one not, not ending this thing. Let's listen to Ray Everham. We're going to take a break right now. We're going to come back with the genius of auto racing, Ray Everham. The Godfather. The most creative. One of the most creative crew chiefs in all of racing. One of the most creative guys in knowing how to make racing move to the future with SRX. Could we get tracks. him to help Stefanelli in North Wilkesboro? Sure. Why not? I'm getting that tomahawk chop. I can't say tomahawk chop. Like you're on a free throw line, you know, counting. Counting. (laughs) Three seconds. He's used to that. Fine, whatever. All right, we'll be right back with the great. Anything else? Well, I have more, but. I'll, I'll Can you let, save I'll, anything for uh, for next week? Anything I always have new stuff for next okay. week. I never come. He looks a little sad. Floor. Yeah, I, I mean, because I only get this time with him. I mean, and his I lip kind of rolled a little bit. It's not out full. I mean, I'm not going. Chad, to save it. us. We'll be right back with Ray Everton. <laughs> you won't want to miss it. Hey, real quick, want to give a shout out to James up in Stoneville, North Carolina. He's a friend of the show. Hell, he's a friend of the family. Now we were able to go ahead and help his family recently save more than $1,200 a month. Really think about this. My man, Robbie didn't save $1,200 one time. He's going to save it each and every month, all because he went to save with Conrad.com. He left us a five-star review earlier this week. And he said this from the first phone call with Christian, all the hard work Diane put in Jennifer taking time to explain things and help me understand where we were at with the deal right up to Steve helping me get this survey through nothing but professionalism all around dealing with first family has helped us to the point we've cut $1,200 a month off our bills. I can't say enough about the team Conrad has assembled. I highly recommend first family to anyone looking to purchase or refinance their home. Thanks to Conrad and the entire first family team. No, thank you, James, for the great review and congratulations on saving 1200 bucks a month. And oh, by the way, you can skip your next two house payments. It's real, folks. Savewithconrad.com can help you. We're licensed in more than 40 states. But if you've got credit card debt, if you're looking to save money on your monthly payments, if you're looking to pay your house off faster, or even buy a house with no money down, Savewithconrad.com is your hookup. Holler if you hear me. That's Savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And oh, by the way, you don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. What are you waiting for? Find out how much money you can save for free at SaveWithConrad.com. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm always leaning right, man. And I'm Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left today. Another special guest from the NASCAR side of the show. From your Rolodex, from your little black book. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, I, I just can't bring it. I just you keep bringing the stars. I keep bringing the delegates. Well, looking for. I've said, I've said this many times. Of the uh, twenty-five plus years I spent racing, doing television, uh, the thing that I 
carry with me the most and appreciate the most at this point in my life are the relationships and the friendships that I made uh, along the way with people in the garage, regardless if they were TV people, drivers, truck drivers, uh, and in this case, a Hall of Fame uh, crew chief and a, and a car owner and TV broadcaster and everything in between. Uh, but one of those people I've always looked up and admired to. Isn't he a tattoo specialist as well, or is that not on the resume? Tattoo specialist? I don't know. I mean, everything else he's done. Why not be have a tattoo shop? We'll, well, no. we'll ask him. All right. All right. We'll ask him. No, no. Actually, first, I'm going to ask him because it says in his bio that he started out as a modified racer. You and I have the Sadler Stanley modified race team in the Smart Series. You always accuse me of inviting every single one of your guests that can drive to drive one of our cars. And then you remind me that I'm going to have to write the check for it. Yeah. Ray, would you like to drive one of our cars in the Smart Series? <laughs> Just get that out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we uh, that was great, man. You know, we started this team kind of a it's one, you know, Ray, we've been working hard and you and I have some things in common as far as a platform that things are important to us. I want to speak speak at. But uh, Bill and I have, have been on this crusade to try to protect small businesses from government overreach and, you know, a lot of other things uh, related to that. So we put our money where our mouth was in a, in a lot of ways. And we said, if we want to create a platform that we can let people know what we're doing for small businesses and, and what we're fighting against and how it could affect normal, everyday working people, what are a couple of things we could do to get that platform out there? One of them was start a podcast, which we've done. And the second one was... And that was your idea, by the way. Yeah. And the second one was, let's start a race team. And that was my idea, yeah, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and he runs the race team, and I run the podcast. It's yeah, kind of so we, uh, we started this open-wheel modified race team. We work with Phil Stefanelli, PSR Products, um, out of North Carolina, and he maintains the car for us. And Tommy Baldwin and his guys help us a little bit. But we built the team from the ground up over the last six months. But you're right. We, we, we won one race earlier this year with Jonathan Brown at Franklin County, Senator Stanley's. Hometown. Uh, hometown. But the biggest one to, uh, to this point was, um, you know, back at North Wilkesboro, the racetrack revival. Um, and we carried uh, Ryan Newman over there, and he drove for us and got a huge win, Ray. And I mean, you, I mean, you know way more about racing than I do and accomplished a lot. There's no more satisfaction than I've ever had being at a racetrack than watching our car uh, with Ryan Newman win that race against those field of drivers at a historic place like North Wilkesboro. Yeah, it was really, it's cool. It's cool to see that back. And, you know, Modifieds have always had a special place in my heart. Of there, you just, it's what I grew up around. I still, you know, in, in, in my car collection here, I have a lot of vintage Modifieds because it's just, you know, I think that they're still the coolest cars out there you know, running around the racetrack. And, uh, you know, the, you know, between them, the sprint cars have always been a big open wheel guy and you know for me i ran i've got the modified i actually ran uh north wilkesboro in 1987 and 1988 they used to have a kind of a combined show they used to run with the cup cars and uh so i ran there a couple years ago and i actually still have that car uh, i've got it here and i i, I was almost I was like damn i ought to take that back over there and you know <laughs> see how she runs you know but uh yeah we got one i've noted it past inspection <laughs> we got a couple right. bill uh, bill talked me into last year before we started the team, Bill thought it'd be a great idea if I went to Motor Mile and, and raced. I hadn't driven anything in several years, but and, and never driven a modified ever. I'd sponsored the race. Yeah, so he carries me over there, talks me into it, and the only injuries I sustained <laughs> was to my rib cage getting in and out of the car. It, the little, uh, <laughs> that little uh, window opening for an old fat guy, retired TV guy, was not. Uh, it didn't match up too well, but I had a ball. Listen, had a ball. listen, yeah. listen. They, they actually, there was, a, there was a big wreck and a lot of things on the track. A lot, they dropped some oil on the track. And we were stopped for about 30 minutes. And every single driver gets out of their car except Hermie. <laughs> Hermie <laughs> sat in the damn car. And only did I learn later, he's like, I ain't getting out of that again and getting bruised up. I, did, I mean, he got sat me in the car never, the whole dang time. Never get back in. But, but you yeah. know, but look, Ray developed the car in SRX where it's got that little door. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we can... Maybe we can have him kind of engineer hey, something uh, for a moment. I'm going to tell you, the reason I did that is because, you know, I, I, all the stuff I've got that I drive, you know, I drove, I had a vintage Trans Am car. I loved it, loved it. And it had a little door open like that. And, you know, I get in and out of my modifies and stuff here too. And I'm like, 
hey, you know, I'm going to be 65 years old in a couple of weeks and I just don't bend like I used to bend. And getting in and out of that 12 and a half inch window on that modified, I know exactly, I know exactly what you're talking about. I, I got my, my Flemington car here and I said to somebody, yeah, look at you, I'll jump right in there. Hell, I almost got stuck halfway, and my, yeah. <laughs> which was kind of embarrassing. It's, it's not a comforting feeling to, you know, everybody else, you know, you got to run a hundred lap race. I'm wore out just getting in the car <laughs> before I've even buckled my belts or anything. Uh, but we've had a lot of fun with it, Ray. And of course, winning Wilkesboro was cool. And, and, uh, you know, we're going to have some other guys slip in and, and drive those cars, you know, later this year and, and, and all that. But hey, 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 I got an idea. So you're going to run Martinsville, aren't you? I'm going to run Ryan. Martinsville. Yeah. Ryan's going to run. You're going to run, right? You, you're steady spending money as I you're know. talking. All right. yeah. I may write the check for this one. Yeah. Why not have Ray be your crew chief? You can't Our, afford him. I, I'm, t- I'm telling you, you can't afford him. No, no. I, <laughs> We'll figure this out. <laughs> but wouldn't you rather have Ray? I mean, the master of the pit stop, the, the master of racing, come in there and lead you to victory and, over and, Ryan Newman and the rest of those uh, wheeling modifieds? And I'll need him to have some specialty tools on hand to get me out look, of the car. Look, we'll get him like a big vat of Vaseline to rub down to get you in and rub down to get you out. Yeah, I, find I, no I, 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 can I, I bring my own? Can I bring my own carburetor? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's for sure. Yes. Look, we want to get to a couple things, Ray. <laughs> um, but you know, you touched on your. A lot of people may or may not know you were a racer yourself. Uh, accomplished a lot, had a good time. But you know, you first your name hit the scene really. Uh, you know, for for me and probably a lot of other people, when you uh, came to work for Rick Hendrick uh, back in the day, that's kind of when you hit mainstream media and you and jeff and rick uh had a team that was well ahead of its time just give me your thoughts if you can on what you were doing before you came right before you came to work for rick how did the conversation with rick go and how did all that team could to, uh, get, get put together that ultimately made history in nascar well i'll try and give you the the quick reader's digest version but you know jeff and i actually met in 1990 I had left IROC. I was with IROC uh, seven or eight years, and I was really fortunate to have worked under Roger Penske and Jay Signori. Jay Signori taught me so much. Unbelievable guy. Love him. Been, been like a dad to me. And uh, I left because I wanted to race. And the whole reason I was at IROC is I wanted to race Roger Penske's Indy cars. I wanted to go Indy car racing. I wanted to be an Indy car driver, running all the open wheel stuff. And uh, so left IROC and started racing, but. Uh, had a lot going on. We were doing really well in, in 1991. But in, so I jumped over. I met Jeff for a few races in 90 because I was doing some other stuff as I was trying to make a living. <laughs> so met this kid, Jeff. We hit it off. Uh, we uh, qualified outside pole at Rockingham in our first uh, first race and went back and worked on my race cars. But then I got hurt kind of early in the 91 season at Flemington, uh, New Jersey. Had, had a crash there that gave me a head injury. And I really couldn't run anymore, so I actually moved down to North Carolina January 2nd, 1992, and went to work for Alan Kowicki. And I worked for Alan. Oh, wow. Yeah, I worked for Alan for like four weeks, and he and I got into it the day before the <laughs> Daytona 500, and I quit. Yeah. And yeah. I, was, I was walking out the gate, walking out the gate, going to go back to New Jersey with my tail between my legs, and I bumped into Preston Miller and Lee Morse from Ford. Remember those, remember those guys? Great guys, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And they said, yeah. where are you going? I said, I'm going home. And they said, where, the hotel? I said, no, New Jersey, I quit, I don't have a job. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. And Jeff was at Bill Davis's, but they hadn't won yet. They've been struggling. And uh, so the Ford people put me over at Bill Davis's. And the first first uh, Bush race we went to uh, was was Hickory. And I've got to tell you, you know, I hope I'm not going to run you over time. If I'm, if I'm talking too long, you tell me, but... Didn't know no, we can talk as long as you want. Because you're telling me stuff yeah. even I, did, I, I didn't even know. Yeah. I, I didn't didn't know a, anything about bush racing, so we were we were at Hickory, and you know I I, I went to I went to Bill's and completely redid the front ends and the cars and redid the bump and the camber and made our own this and that and you know that was my thing. I was a handling guy, right? But we get to we get to uh, Hickory and. The motor guy at that time, he he wasn't real fond of me coming on there and whatever. But we get there, and Jeff's like, I don't know what to do. We're changing, man. We're throwing stuff. But we're only about 15th quick, no matter what. And, and like, no matter what we did, we were up and down on springs. He said, look, I'm telling you, like, this is as fast as I can go. So, the you know, I, I'm looking at their, their changing uh, 
motors and, and all that stuff. And, and I and I said, do you need the do you need the restrictor plate off that other motor? And he said, he, he goes, this is there ain't no restrictor plate on that. This ain't cup racing. There's no restrictor plate on that motor. I said, oh yeah, there, there's a restrictor plate on that motor. And they go over there, and sure enough, we've been running the whole time with the still had the restrictor plate on it from at Hickory. Yeah, <laughs> Hickory. Yeah, so they take that restrictor plate off, man. He goes out there and just blows through the field like <laughs> unbelievable. And I guess the thing blew up or something. But then uh, the next three races, we went we went to uh, Rockingham, sat on the pole, missed, missed the race set up because I just still was getting to it. I hadn't even seen some of these places. I'd never even seen Rockingham, right? And then mm-hmm. we went to Richmond, and uh, we sat on the pole and missed the race set up again, but still finishing somewhere in the top ten. And then we decided we're going to go to Atlanta test. And we got down there in Atlanta and test some things and move around. We were pretty good. We went to Atlanta, sat on the pole, and then we won the race. But the mm-hmm. car was so loose the first I think, time. I think, I think I remember I think I remember Rick saying several times through the years that that's the first time he recalled watching Jeff yeah. drive a race car and the car control that he had, even at that point with that limited amount of experience in a full body stock car caught Rick's eye. I think that's I'm right in saying that. No, yeah, 100%. And that was, I'll tell you, when we used to have the bias ply tires, that was, we were still biasing. He was smoking the right rear around Atlanta, just digging, right, for the first couple laps. Mm-hmm. So we win that race, and they, you know, they they get ready to hire Jeff. And Jeff says, I want this guy, Ray Evernham, to, to go. And, you know, I, when I went and looked at Hendrick, I said, Jeff, if, you know, if we can't win there, we can't win anywhere. That man's got everything that they need. So I, I, I didn't think I was ready to be a crew chief. I, I, I said, no, I can't be the crew chief. I'm the chassis guy. You know, let me build the cars and let me, that's what I do. And Rick Hendricks said, no, you're going to be the crew chief. Jeff wants you to be the crew chief. And I said, man, I, I don't know how to be a crew chief. He said, well, this guy will help you and we'll help you. And I said, I, I, I think we should hire a crew chief. He said, well, that's the only job I got. Take it or leave it. <laughs> and Rick, Rick turned me Rick's into Rick's very persuasive. Chief. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and talk, talk a second about Rick. Um, you know, he's from originally up around uh, Palmer Springs, Virginia, you know, close to where I'm from and um, not a nicer guy in the world. And people have asked me over and over again. He he's a, has a special connection to Elliot. Now, he helped my mom when she was going through breast cancer and helped, you know, send his plane and do some other things to help us when we were going through all of that. But the most impressive thing ever about Rick, and I know, Ray, you'll appreciate this. Years ago, I went with Rick and Jeff and a couple people down to Jeff's car dealership in Wilmington, North Carolina, or the Jeff Gordon Chevrolet dealership to do an appearance with him when I just started doing TV. And we walk into this dealership and go in the shop area at, at one of Rick's hundreds of dealerships and walk through the back of the shop. And he called everybody in the shop by name, every mechanic, every wash person, everything he knew and to me, of all the things that Rick has done and all the things that you and I both, Ray, know that Rick has done for people behind the scenes that nobody knows, the big, the best quality I remember that day with Rick was, how does this guy know everybody's name in this one dealership in Wilmington, North Carolina? Just a unbelievable guy is Rick Hendrick. Uh, you, your thoughts on some of your early days uh, working for Rick back in those days? Well, you're spot on. Rick is an amazing man, and, and he, um, you know, there's there's two styles of, 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 of leadership, right? You know, but a real leader is a person who puts their people ahead of them, and Rick will always tell you that his people are the most important asset that he has, and he puts them ahead of himself, and, and he treats every single person seriously like they are part of his family, and, you know, he is... Uh, he really is a special person, and again, he makes sure that all of his his other company managers and leaders feel the same way. When you go there, it, it, it's really about the people, whether that's the people in the dealerships or the people in the on the race team. And you know, Rick is a very very generous man and helps tons and tons of of, of people that you'll never hear about. He doesn't take credit for it. But some of the things that he does just around the city of Charlotte, some of the things that he's done in the racing community, as you said, some of the things that he he did to help you, you know, that that's just him. He is uh, he is one of the few people that you could do a handshake deal 
for a lot of money, uh, and and you you would never have to worry about it. You know, he is truly uh, truly a, a, an honest guy. Talk about Rick Hendrick and talking about money. My first tough question of the show is: 1995, somebody got fined sixty thousand dollars for what they called unapproved parts. So, as the crew chief, I guess it, is the statute of limitations expired, Senator Stanley? Uh, in Virginia? <laughs> uh, no. no, we no. So, what what <laughs> what have you talked about over the years, or what was going on with that car that warranted a sixty thousand dollar penalty in nineteen ninety five from NASCAR, or was it a gray area? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because me and Gary Nelson, I just saw Gary Nelson at a at a road race. Uh, this this past weekend we were kidding around about it but i'll tell you exactly what happened all that all that and, and i'm giving this away because well, I, I am finally writing a, a book about all this stuff but uh you know everybody said oh titanium 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 well it wasn't titanium what it was uh you know we weren't supposed to be drilling the hubs and lightening up all that stuff and we were starting to do that for qualifying and i found a set of hubs that were made by a manufacturer that that were already uh milled out and they were light and that way, by the rule book, it says we weren't supposed to drill them. So in my feeling, I didn't drill them. They came drilled. <laughs> you know? mm, so there you go. We put them on, and uh, we had a plate that would slide over it and used to have to TIG it on there. And one of the we hired a new fabricator, and he reached in there and hit it with a MIG, which is not good, you know, on the, on the <laughs> two types of metal. You had soft metal versus, uh, you know, the really alloy stuff that was in the hubs. We ran them in qualifying, and... Uh, Unfortunately, they didn't get taken off the car for the 600, and it broke. And you know, if they were not approved, um, and the, the the fine for a non-approved part was $1,500. I got that fine of $60,000 because they really wanted to make a, a point. Like, everybody was starting to push the deal. That hub broke, and the tire got away from that car. It could have went in the grandstands. Mm -hmm. It could have come in the pit area. It could have killed someone, and that would have been... A really bad day for racing and all of us so uh you know I, I never held that against gary nelson or mr france i understood what they had to do um but i'll, I'll tell you i had to sit down with mr france and he he was you know you probably had a couple of them you know yeah but he yeah, sat yeah, down yeah. that day and i mean i loved the guy he, he he was amazing the way he could get something across and, but i understood when i left like man i need to, I, I need to not screw around like that anymore and he told me he said if you don't screw around with the restrictor plate you don't put nothing in your fuel and you don't put nothing on your tires me and you'll get along fine you start doing that stuff and i will send your ass out of here that was his exact words <laughs> and i bet he meant it uh, i bet he meant it what a what an intimidating guy but but just the, the vision that france family's always had but going back to uh to jeff gordon did you know pretty early on or, or when did it settling with you that or did you ever think leading into that relationship with jeff gordon that y'all would win the races and accomplish the things that y'all did as a team through all those years well you, you know the first time i ever saw jeff gordon drive a race car you know i i used to watch him on the thursday night thunders and stuff like that and i thought man this kid's pretty good but i had worked through iraq with mario andretti and aj foy and the answers and dale earnhardt richard petty you know a great drivers the best. around the world yeah. the best and you know you know as well as i do when you talk to a great driver they've just got a different view of of time and, and like their windshield is much bigger than a lot of other people's the stuff that they can describe and the first time i saw jeff jump in that bush car which was at charlotte motor speedway at a test do what he did and the way that he came in and was able to describe everything to me i think myself there's no way that can be experienced this kid is just talented and uh, i knew he was something special and I just always hoped that if we could do what we we just keep him in, a, in good stuff. And, you, you know, the, honestly, if we'd have been anywhere but Hendrick Motorsports, we probably couldn't have done that. Because I, I'm going to tell you, Rick Hendrick stood aside and let me do a lot of things that weren't the way it was being done. And I had been through that. You, you know, you get an older crew chief or you get somebody and they go, that ain't the way we do that or whatever. And I brought in a lot of things that I had learned on the modifieds and a lot of things that I learned on the IROC cars. And re remember that was about the time that we were switching to the radial tire. 
you know, and I had t I had done all that testing with Goodyear. I had done all the testing with Penske Shock, and I needed to build the cars a little bit different than what they were used to. And Rick Hendrick let me do that. I give y'all credit too for, you know, and I know a lot of people feel the same way. Not only did y'all put work and extra detail into your cars, but you were the first one that, that came in and looked at the overall operation of the race team, you know, from top to bottom. And not only the race car and the and the parts and pieces on the car, but you know, the pit crew, obviously the famous Rainbow Warrior side, but you guys are the first ones that really, you know, to and, and Senator Stanley and I were talking before we got you on. You like you remember the Wood brothers were kind of the first ones to kind of see the importance of pit stops, but you guys just took that thing to a whole nother level, specialized people and tire changers and your diet and all those things involved. What what made you believe that you needed to have your finger on all those different aspects of a, of a car or a team to have the kind of success y'all had? Well, it's no different than having a company or doing anything. There's a lot of different things that it takes to win races. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that we could focus on, on all those things. And a lot of it, Hermie, was really about time efficiency. Our whole, our whole world, our race world is time. How fast can you go? How fast can you? And then I thought more about having efficiency of time, you know, to get the car done, but then to have time to make it go faster. So I really organized our deal like a professional sports franchise. I looked at a lot of football teams and basketball teams and how they did their coaching and how they had, you know, head coaches for this and how they broke their teams up. And, and you know, I, I had my chief mechanic who, who was kind of, you know, Ed Guzza would, would take care of the cars. And then Brian Weitzel was the engineer. And, you know, I, I had Chad Canal, and guys like that in the fab shop. And, and then, you know, uh, Andy Pop on the pit crew. And we would meet like a team and, and honestly think about, okay, how can we do this and how can we do it better? And I just knew that if we could do that, you know, not only did we have, you know, the resources Rick Hendrick was giving us, but we had time to, to think about how to make that car go faster. You know, you know, sometimes being at the shop, if you got to be there eight, 10 hours, you're there eight, 10 hours, but you, you maybe could have got work done in, in seven or eight hours and then had two hours to rub on stuff to make it go faster. So I really took a, a, a hard look at the direction of the sport and knowing that there were, there was a lot of ways to get ahead without necessarily having a fast car. Ultimately, after your Hall of Fame career, uh, end up being Hall of Fame career at Hendrick Motorsports, you went into uh, a transition over to ownership with Dodge. And uh, I'm just curious what, you know, what uh, what prompted that or uh, what factors came into play and the timing of that when you decided to uh, change career paths and ultimately bring Dodge, you know, back into yeah, back big time sport. racing. Yeah. yeah, brought him back to the sport. Hardest decision I ever had to make in my life, right? But, um, you know, Hendrick was my family. They're, they're still family to me. Jeff Gordon's like a brother. You know, we still, I see him more now than I used to. We, we talk, you know, we got, we got some things coming up that people are going to hear about soon that we're doing together. But, uh, you know, we had done a lot in the seven years that I was there, a lot. Some, you know, we won everything, some of it two, three, four times. And people change, you know, Je Jeff was, was not the same kid. I was not the same person. You know, you're, you're, you're going, we had this great success, but the, we were, I think, both looking for more for something else. And, you know, with, with, with the Dodge thing, you, you know, I really honestly looked at the computers and the simulation and all the stuff was going on. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to beat that computer someday with my little black book. I need to really pay attention. And when Dodge came to me and said that I could run that program, I could have my own race team. I could help them design a car from scratch, design a motor from, from scratch and built like I could really do it. And I, I think I, I really just wanted to know if I could do it, if I, if I could be successful uh, without Jeff Gordon. And I think at the same time, Jeff kind of needed to know on himself, like, what what could he do? Um, and, you know, again, I went to, to, to see Rick Hendrick, and he wasn't happy. Uh, <clears throat> but he, he knew that that was best for me. And, you know, without him being a gentleman, that wouldn't have happened. I mean, he basically let me out of a long-term contract to go do it. 
because I was going to, I was going to ask you, did you have yeah. still had time on your deal with Rick and yeah. all that? Yeah, I had a con I was under contract with Rick Hendrick and he could have squashed that whole deal and didn't because in his heart, he knew it was a good deal for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, again, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much I uh, respect that man. But uh, so that interested me to see if I could do it. But then, Her Hermie, what I found out is, you know, that really wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I, I didn't really enjoy that. Um, you, make, you make a lot of money really quick, right? You're flying around in airplanes. You're meeting with sponsors. You're doing this. You're doing that. But I missed working on the race cars. I, I love cars. That's what I have this shop today, and we screw around with a bunch of vintage cars and these race cars and everything, because that's what I like to do. You know, that's and I, I the 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 first couple of years with my race team, I could be involved, and I felt like we were doing something. And then the bigger we got, it grew so fast that it was hard for me to be involved, be involved, to be down there on the floor on the plate or really working with the guys. And then I just felt like I lost touch for everything. And at, at the racetrack, I didn't even feel like I would, I felt like a guest sitting up on the box, <laughs> you know, I just, wow. so I, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't like it. So, so it, it was time when I got the opportunity to get out, I got out. We want to talk SRX and a little bit about your involvement in that. But before we get off NASCAR, I'm curious your, your thoughts on this generation car we're racing now and the overall, you know, uh, it looks like just from watching, there's a little bit of a resurgence, you know, as far as in the sport and the interest and competitiveness on the racetrack and all that. But just your overall view of NASCAR racing in 2022. I think, honestly, this, this generation car is probably the biggest single thing uh, that's been great for the sport since the safety uh, regulations. Um, the, you know, that, you know when, when we lost Dale at, at Daytona, NASCAR did some things that I think that have saved – drivers lives around the world that was big but th this car was something absolutely positively the best thing that they've done you know you, you just look at the results like it, it, you, the, the the competition on the track the, the amount of cars that are running you know i think it's fantastic they built this car from scratch and have had as little bit of problem as they've had you know for as many races as they've run short tracks road courses super speedways dirt tracks you know i think it's uh, amazing and you know it's not just something I think. Look at the TV ratings up. Look at the crowd at Michigan yesterday. The crowd at Michigan was the biggest that it's been since 2016, the biggest infield since 2012. You know, the, we've got some great young drivers starting to come into their own and battling it out and whatnot. I, I, I you know, whether it's, whether it's, you know, Jim France, Steve Phelps, Mike, I don't know who, who's doing the whole deal, but they, they've made the right decisions to bring nascar back to where it needs to be two two driver related questions number one ross Chastain seems to be kind of a lightning rod right now going out and racing and getting on people's nerves a little bit i kind of enjoy it i sit on the couch and don't have a dog in the fight so it's kind of fun to to watch that so your thoughts on ross if you have any I mean, also if you were to come back and somebody offered you a deal you decided to get back into nascar racing whether it be owner, crew chief level, if you could had to pick your driver to drive your car out of who's on the track now, uh, who would you pick? Or who would, who, I won't put you on the spot. Who would be the couple you would pick from? Yeah. Um, well, as far as Ross goes, I think it's great that, you know, that he's worked his way up in his town. He's a different type personality. And I like that. I think the sport needs that. The sport needs good guys. It needs bad guys. Not everybody's going to like the same guy. I kind of like, you know, he, you know, he's, he's, he's rough. He's not afraid to run, but, but, you know, there's been, there's been tons of other guys like that too, that have, that have ruffled feathers. We need a little controversy, right? You, you need somebody that's going to mix it up. And I think the battle between he and Denny Hamlin turns televisions on and it keeps people interested. I think so, you know, I, uh, I don't know if I'd like Ross if he wasn't driving for me, but I think I'd like him a lot if he was. <laughs> you know, and, and overall, I, I think that what Justin Marks has done with that race team is incredible too. That, that goes to me. It really is. Back yeah. To what the you know when you look at this Gen Seven car, it's allowing people to come in and be competitive. Boy, as far you know, as far as uh, the couple of 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 people, it it'd be uh, it'd be it'd be kind of hard. Uh, to to not say well 
if you're going to give me a couple, I'm going to have to take Chase Elliott and Kyle Larson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how do you how do you view their driving styles? Uh, you know, they both get the job done, but they appear to drive cars a little bit different. So, what, how would you break down their driving styles? You know, I think the biggest thing, you know, their their driving style is a little different. You know, where I think Kyle Kyle grew up in a different world than 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 Chase did. Chase still um, drives a lot like his dad. Uh, you know, and I, I've I've said this. You know. Chase thinks about things differently, maybe about the car, um, a lot more of the racetrack, the actual racecraft. And, and, you know, Bill, you know, I, I always tell everybody, look, I worked with two drivers that if I'd have took a silver dollar and laid it on the racetrack at Daytona or Talladega, both of them could have found it and run it over. Bill could have told you if it was heads or tails. Right, Jeff would have picked it up wow. put it in his pocket and reinvested <laughs> it, you know. But, uh, but, but so I think Chase technical is thinking about the car the track the, the race where Kyle Larson is is just amazing about adapting what he's doing with the steering wheel with the pedals and knowing that I think you know and you know as well as I do because you've worked with him you're a great race driver your brother is a great race driver and people think that what makes a great race driver oh he's brave oh he's got to have quick reflexes and that's all bs it's about yeah, being smart yeah. right it's it's about that racing IQ as I said, the, the best drivers have a bigger windshield. They're seeing more. They're feeling more. They're slowing time down. And I do think that um, Chase and, and, and Kyle, you know, they're, they, they think kind of the same way. But Kyle's used to maybe running a little bit harder, a little bit more on the edge, where Chase is very methodical about his approach to things. And he may be able to give – a little bit more information about what the car needs to help Alan Gustafson get it good. A couple more things before we let you go. Uh, Hold on. Uh, he, he brought something up, and I just want to uh, check with him. He had Bill Elliott and Casey Kane together on a team, yeah. the Dodge team. Yeah. I mean, I remember every girl was swooning for Casey Kane. Yeah. Bill Elliott's just the smartest driver ever. I mean, those are like the great packages. And then he had Elliott as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what a team. What, what, Elliot, I mean, this other gentleman, each Elliot, had their own gifts. Elliot was one of my favorite drivers um, because he was a pleasure to work with. And I think towards the end there, I didn't have the equipment that Elliot needed to win races. But he, you could not ask for a better teammate um, than Elliot and, and a better guy to work with. And I always tell the fun, funny story that when, when we, uh, we all went to the movies when – Days of, not Days of Thunder, um, Talladega Nights came. Talladega out. Nights, Talladega yeah. Night. yeah. And <laughs> everyone's laughing but Elliot. And I was like, what's the matter? And then I realized he didn't get it. It was about him. So I started <laughs> I started calling him Ricky Bobby. and, and Ricky uh, Bobby, yeah. yeah. Ricky Bobby. Well, you know, I've seen him twice say, save me Oprah Winfrey. I'm on yeah. fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he uh, was at Fleming's in Richmond. gentleman did a lot for us. I just, uh, as I said, I always felt bad that I couldn't get him to Victory Lane. What a great three, though. I mean, the legend, Bill Elliott. Yeah. Casey Kane, who was like the hottest guy ever. I mean, he brought women to the sport. You remember that? I got to tell you, Ray probably didn't know this, but. And, and then, and then Casey, the guy was the guy everyone yeah, wanted to drink a beer with. The night after Casey won the All-Star race um, for you, we had a little get-together. Oh, he invited us <laughs> over to a get-together at his house at the lake later that night. So Casey had to do his post-race stuff. So Elliot and I, a couple of us, we went ahead on over to Casey's house, and we were you know, waiting for Casey to get there. Elliot and I get there, and it's a great night, of course. You know, huge win, all that. We go knock on the door. Casey's brother, Kale, comes to the front door, and he's got a robe on like Ric Flair. <laughs> and we're like, because the party had been going on you know, for hours. We walk downstairs. <laughs> And Kale and all of Casey's buddies had thrown all of Casey's pool furniture and TVs and stuff into the pool. Mm. It was in the pool. Those are great friends. What great friends. Yeah. And, um, and I just thought, you know, because I never saw Casey get mad a whole lot. And I just said, I told Elliot, I said, I don't know how long it's going to be before Casey gets here, but I've just got to wait here so I can see what exactly Casey says or does to Kale or, you know, whatever. And Casey just walks in, looks all his furniture's in the pool, and he just grins. 
He's a you know, just looking looking like that didn't say anything, but that was a huge, huge win uh, for 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 you and that team and for Casey uh, at that time. And no 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 nicer guy ever that I've ever uh, been associated with in NASCAR than uh, than Casey Kane. Want to ask you real quickly about SRX? What was your involvement with that? What is your involvement with that? What got you in? What got you? Uh, involved in that and what do you see the future of it uh, coming up well you know my, my i've always loved iraq and i really thought that uh it, it was a great entertaining thing for the race fans and as time went on you know things changed harder to get drivers and i just felt like the cycle had come around where there was a spot of, there, there was room now for motorsports entertainment putting the guys in equal cars and really about entertainment, but taking it and putting it on the short tracks in front of the fans. Instead of the fans having to go to a big Coliseum, Daytona and Charlotte and Talladega and places, we'd go around the country with fans. So, you know, it was it was my idea and whatnot. Um, had a couple partners uh, in it and uh, last year designed the cars, built the cars. You know, the people at Fury did the chassis. The great, they great, basically used their road race car with a couple uh, modifications and, and uh, really felt like we we had something there but a, a, as with a lot of things you know there are people involved sometimes don't always go in the want to go in the same direction and for me i have to do everything right and i have to do it's got to be about the race and uh, sometimes a business thinks differently you know and again i only know one way when it comes to you know the, 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 i really feel that the, the iraq stuff and and uh, the, the the way that we were doing it it, it, it had just a ton of potential. So we had a little bit of, you know, difference of opinion. And, and uh, so I backed away from it this year. I'm still uh, one mm -hmm. of the owners. I still have my money in it, but I have not had anything to do with the competition at all um, since uh, November of last year. Or, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, last year. Can I, can I ask why? I don't want to get personal here, but I'm going to tell you right now. When you started, it was a great idea. The way you built the cars, great idea. The way you brought it back to short tracks, Back to the roots of racing, heat races, qualified inverted fields, 75 lappers, getting the small area, rural areas that built up racing, making them important again, putting it on mainstream TV at 8 o'clock at night, over by 10, getting people interested in racing, getting my son Chandler totally gigged on this stuff, and having a PlayStation 4 game. I mean, what a perfect, what a perfect recipe to really bring back racing at the at the grassroots level right back up into the mainstream. I mean, it was a perfect package. I, I think it's a brilliant on your part. I, I admire you for it. In fact, uh, every time we turn on the PS4, the PlayStation 4 game, we listen to Ray. We don't click through it when he backs the car out and tells you exactly what the car is and what the purpose of the racing series is. My son loves it. He's 11 years old, just watching that every time. Why isn't that ingredient? Why why isn't the chef still stirring the soup? Can I ask you that, or you, I, yeah, you'd, you'd probably be better off asking some of the fi financial and people and things like that. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, a as I said, when when you have when when you have partners in in something, and you know, racing has always been my passion and vision, and you know, it, it uh, you. I'm trying to make sure I don't get myself in trouble by, by don't saying, worry, I'm a lawyer. I can help you out if I screw you up. Okay? <laughs> there's a certain, there's a certain way that I'm wrong. Yes. There's a certain, there's a certain way that things have to be done to be successful like they were last year. Okay. And you know, part of yeah. that is, is, is doing what you say you're going to do. And you've got to be willing to keep funding going behind that, um, rather than worry about the profit right away. Uh, you know, I'm right. always a firm believer in if you do something right, you build a foundation right, you know, it'll come. And uh, again, there were a lot of commitments made that just, you know, that, that, that I felt weren't honored. And with me, when I, you start your career working with a guy like Roger Penske, and then you work with a guy like Rick Hendrick, and I was fortunate enough to work with Dodge at Dieter Zetcha, as I said, there are many people in the business that a handshake agreement is... You know, you, you can live by that. And there are many people in the business that that <laughs> that, that you don't. It doesn't mean anything. So I'll just leave right, it. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. I thought at that time Let's, the best thing for me to do was was take a step back. Well, I hate that because that, that is pure genius. What you brought to the table. I think it's it's got staying power. It makes young people interested. 
Uh, it keeps the interest. You bring back the classic racers with the new racers. The car is great. It's equal. You're doing asphalt and dirt. Uh, you've got a very popular PlayStation 4 video game that uh, I have to play incessantly with my son. We were in an interview with uh, Michael Waltrip. My son loves Bobby Labonte. Of course, he gets to hang out with him at the Smart Series. And so every time when we race like a PS ga- a PlayStation game on, on, uh, on say, NASCAR, uh, he puts me in the fence. I take Michael Waltrip and I wreck his ass repeatedly. And, and Michael was very appreciative of that. But but what a great what a great from the alpha to the omega that you've created. I hope you get back into it, or you know what, Hermie, maybe we get him in to take the smart series to the next level by driving our car. And you maybe make a lot of promises and commitments on this show and, and using you know his to raise points. Is yeah. excellent. You know what? <laughs> well, hopefully well, this is a discussion for another day. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we can do something uh, again like that. I, I really believe I believe in the idea and I, I believe in it. I just. Um, said you know we we it just needs to be it needs to be done in the way that uh again that i laid it out i think there's a perfect spot for a form of motorsports entertainment but as with anything else it, it takes consistent funding and it takes commitment you know everybody it's got to yeah. be it's got to be a priority to everybody involved two other quick things well, i believe in ray well i believe in the ray way two other quick things before we let you go um you were inducted to the NASCAR Hall of Fame in 2018. Awesome. What did that mean to you? Robert Yates, Red Byron, Kenny Squire, Ron Hornaday Jr., and the man, Ray Evernham. You know, it, that, it, it's easy to see um, why so many men that we look up to get, you are drawn to tears on that stage there. It is a fire hose of emotions. Uh, it, it, it's an unbelievable feeling to know that you're being honored by your peers, but at the same time, it, it makes you think about all of the people who helped you get there. And so many people, you know, like helped me, like, like volunteered on my car or taught me something or whatever. And at that moment, I really felt like I hadn't let them down. Like they hadn't, I hadn't wasted their time. And it was, it was overwhelming and still the greatest honor I've ever gotten. Yeah, and I mean, just think of how many jobs you created by revolutionizing the pit stop. So many Division One A, Division One athletes, football players that could not go onto the pros in the NFL or some other sport now work and get paid a heck of a lot of money. And you've made really the pit stop as interesting, as important as the race, race itself on the track. I mean, you know, your impact has been wide ranging, long reaching. And, and the fact that you can have done what you have done whether it be a crew chief or owner, uh, revolutionizing pit stops, and then you step out and create a sport like SRX, you create that kind of racing that brings in the new generation. Man, that that is a big brain, and we need more big brain stuff like that, so please keep doing that, and uh, big, big fan of yours. And, and finally, you know, Hermie says he has a lot of big friends that – do a lot of big things. He said, yeah, no, I know it. Ray Evanham. I said, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Turns out he did. Uh, Hermie and I share a, you know, a special gift. We, we both have children. Uh, you're both short? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm a little taller than he is, but we both have yeah, yeah, a lot of the autism spectrum. And so Hermie's yeah. done uh, an amazing yeah. job raising money and awareness and try with my, nice. uh, with my son too. But that is, uh, you know, that is something that a bond that we do share and, uh, you know, we, as I said, it, it's a blessing to have those two children on the spectrum. How, uh, how is uh, how is Ray J doing? He is doing fantastic. Um, Ray J is. Uh, and how old is he now? He's 31 years old. <laughs> 31. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Haley's 24. I can't I, believe I, it. And, and I, I, I see your pictures on Instagram and, and whatnot. But it's uh, it's it's been amazing. It's and amazing. both you and your brother and a lot of other racers have done things to continue to raise awareness because that's what we've got to do. We've got to continue That's to raise right. awareness about people on the spectrum. So well, next time, ne- next time y'all get something going, I know uh, I haven't been to a racetrack really. Uh, I retired from from Fox TV at the end of 2019, and I I miss everybody dearly. And of course, COVID and other things, it just it's just not as easy to get back going. But uh, I hope we can maybe work together on, on the future, uh, in the future, on something like that. Money is you got to have it, but the awareness. Um, is is the absolute uh, most important things, uh, um, and, and and thank you 
to you and Aaron and your family and everybody that's always uh, gone in with both feet and put your uh, name and resources and funding and everything on the line as well. It it takes everybody. It takes everybody to 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 keep that uh, to keep that going. And Ray, thank you so much for taking a few time. I really admire you. I appreciate you. Thank you for what you've done for the sport. You really helped guys like me uh, coming along have better opportunities and and uh, you know everything. I, I really do really do appreciate everything you've done. And Ray, uh, what email do I send? An invite to get you fitted for that fire suit for the Sadler Stanley <laughs> Racing Modified. Just a, just a, Hermie's got my phone number. You just send it there. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, if I go through Hermie, <laughs> it may slow down the process. I want to direct so we can I, get this. I'm, I'm just Ray yeah. at RayEvernham.com. Yeah. We'll, we'll, agree. we'll get your people in touch with his people and his yeah, people yeah, talk yeah, to your people, people. And, yeah 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 and if yeah, i was really yeah, yeah. smart so the, as you think i am i would have become an agent for pit crews i could have been a wealthy man Ooh, yeah. there you go wait i smell a business opportunity here <laughs> i mean somebody needs a lawyer through this i can help it through the process but ray what a, what a great interview what a great honor to talk to you uh really hope you do come to the smart series southern modified uh, racing tour uh, where Hermie and I have put together this team to really bring awareness to to small businesses, to to our short tracks, to our rural areas that depend so much on these race uh, tracks to to live and survive. And quite frankly, uh, we want to build the sport back up. But we think you are that great pillar and foundation uh, that have done so much, not just for the sport, but then to reinvigorate that sport in the future. Man, uh, I'm a big fan, big hero. You're my big. You know, I just cannot thank you enough for what you do, and can't wait to meet you in person. When we're slipping in to the SSR, <laughs> what, 16 or the 22? What do you think? Ray, we need, we need to cut this. We need, 39? We just, Ray's got to go. He's got. No, Ray, yeah. no, no, we, we got to negotiate. Yeah. I'm a lawyer. What do you, I negotiate. Yeah. Yeah. No? Uh, well, See, let's, let's stay in touch <laughs> about it. Say, give, give my best to Ricky Bob. I will. I will. <laughs> Ray, thank you so much for Thanks, your time, Ray. and we'll see you at the racetrack real soon. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Thank All you. All right. Bye-bye. That's Hall of Fame crew chief Ray Evernham. Man, Chef Moss is and that is the fourteenth driver you've invited to to race for the SS Racing. Can you Modified imagine team. if we could just run a full schedule? <laughs> you imagine drivers I have. You need to go find you another million bucks somewhere. Uh, uh, well, after talking to your wife at your estate planning meeting, <laughs> yeah, okay. I think we have a new sponsor. <laughs> Speaking of wives <laughs> and sponsors, uh, that was our. Uh, leaning no, left, turning, turning, turning left. Well, sometimes I'm leaning. <laughs> yeah, I get it right now, but you're leaning over. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> our turning left moment this week, and what a great Ooh, guest! What man. a great. Hot. In some of the stories Chef he told, Moss is right. You bring this. I did up. not know all about how yeah. the Gordon thing yeah. came together. I did not know he was not involved in the day to day of SRX yeah. anymore. Didn't know any of that because that, I mean, when I think of SRX, I think of Ray Everham. Well, before I mean, we, we can continue involved. talking, I mean, he's, a, he's an owner, but he's not. Involved. We can That's continue talking, but I do need to let everybody know that our no, turning no, left no, I, I, I moment understand. How is would they sponsored by Ray Laura go? Stanley and Vista Installation. I don't know how they'd let Laura Ray has go. been running a successful window Ray's indoor geez. installation he's the company. Einstein of racing. Why do you let Einstein go? The sponsor's not going to be happy that you talked over her sponsor. I'm mission. still talking. <laughs> Laura has been running a successful window and door installation mm-hmm. company and babysitting politicians for, 12 for over twelve years. years. Yep. She, the Ray Everham interview was proudly brought to you by Vista. Vista. Yeah. Well, well, you know what? They're getting their money's worth. Because that's, that is, that is, that is a Sunday with the cherry on top. Right as far there. as crew chiefs go, you know, you put Chad Canals there, you put Ray Everham there, you put, yeah. you know, um, I mean, there's, there's, he's in that Mount Rushmore yeah. of NASCAR crew chiefs. Dale Inman, I mean, you can. Inman, uh, you know, there's. Is the a, guy that ran uh, ran uh, Earnhardt to like what? A couple Kirk Schemeling. Schemeling, yeah. Schemeling. yeah. So he's he's in the conversation. But you go into the class of 2018 with the names of Robert Yates, Red Byron, Kenny Squire, and Ron Hornaday Jr. I yep. mean, and Ray Evernham. Yep. Amazing. That's great. I mean, that's 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 got to be something where you know what? And you would think, all right, I've done it all. I'm good. I can go relax, rest on my laurels, move on. No, you know what he does? I'm going to bring. I'm going to bring racing to the mainstream, the 18 to 35s during the 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock hour. Creates a race in and of itself with legends, with currents, in short tracks, local areas, with a brand new car, asphalt and dirt 
and he's not still running or apart? Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I don't told, know if I'm going to watch it again. I told you how difficult it is to have partners in motorsports. <laughs> We're talking about well, it right you're now. You're talking about like more than two. I'm month. talking about having two. What? Um, <laughs> and so far, we've been able to work it out. Yeah, because you're the if boss. You keep, if you keep hiring drivers, you're, you're the boss. Every podcast. I'm not hiring. I'm inviting. Yeah, inviting them to drive, which is. Right. And then I send them over to you, and you're supposed <laughs> to work this out. Yeah, right. Work send it me out. the paperwork, and I'll write it out. But, I'm you know, I give, I give Ray credit. You know, he said he was still invested in it financially. Okay. Uh, but if you, you know, if you don't believe in a vision of what something is, is happening, then, you know, the most telling part of that interview that we talked about when he left Hendrick Motorsports and went to create his own race team with the factory support of Dodge. Yeah. He talked about all the money he made flying around on airplanes, doing all that great stuff. But he realized he was no longer doing what he really loved to Wasn't do. Fulfilling. That was working on race cars, trying to figure out being in the shop on the setup plate with your coworkers, trying to figure out, yeah. How to tweak a car to take it to Daytona and win the Daytona 500. He basically, though, created that car in SRX. Yeah. I mean, basically did from the ground up. Went and tested it, made sure it was equal, made sure everything was right. And I wonder, you know, I'm thinking back now to the interview we did with uh, Michael Waltrip, who said it, it's different from last year to this year. Last year was a lot more fun. Everybody's running around kind of at the top, always competitive. This year was less competitive, at least maybe to him. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that's I don't know. has something to do with it. I don't know. Because, you know, there's no, nobody more passionate about the inner workings of from a chassis from the ground on up about a race car than Ray Evans. Yeah. And, and you know, the people that it takes to make it work before they ever get it out on the track. Yeah, but I, Ray I, I, I applaud him for not going through the motions. I mean, if you're really and truly, if you're not, if you're not <laughs> passionate about something or you don't like the way the direction's going, then it's not like the personality that's working for Alan Kowicki, his first job. You're at Daytona and says, F this, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm going <laughs> I mean, to New Jersey. I, like that. I didn't know any of that. Either. I like that. I mean, just, so, just get some right before the race. But I say this to you a lot. That's awesome. I say this to you a lot, and I truly mean this. My friendships and relationships that I created through my 25 years of traveling, at the NASCAR circus, as we call it, is so rewarding. You know, I feel like I've got lifelong friends that I made, um, and – it really boils down to, in a lot of cases, just like what Ray said, you know, when you work for Rick Hendrick and you work for Roger Penske and you do this and then you get into another situation and things don't go, maybe people are not doing exactly what they said they were going to do, then that, uh, that makes a difference. Well, you've and, proven it here. And I think what you prove also is as competitive at the highest level that that is, there's still kind of that family bond. Sure. Because there's only a certain number of you that are involved in any of this. Yeah. Men, women, you know, even the children of race car drivers or race car builders. There's all that fraternity spirit that, that I guess maybe you don't appreciate it at the time when you're running, but years after when you're done, you realize how much it matters because that's the memories that bind you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we talk a lot about uh, the memories that you have with these people uh, that your brother Elliot has or they have with you. And that seems to be the, the, the glue that binds everybody together to make sure that we may have had disagreements. We may have been competitors on the track, uh, but we are part of actually an evolution of a sport in the United States of America. That's pretty awesome. I want to thank uh, our friends at Pacematic again yes. for their support of this podcast. Pacematic is more than an entertainment company. They're part of the community, giving back and helping communities grow and thrive. That's why Pacematic is a proud sponsor of the Smart Racing Tour and this podcast because Pacematic believes in supporting the neighborhoods that they work in. To learn more about Pacematic and the work they're doing, visit www.pacematic.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we really thank you for being a part of this podcast, listening. It's growing. Make sure that you uh, tell your friends, leaning right and turning left with Sadler and the Senator. You can find it on SadlerStanleyRacing.com. You can find all the podcast episodes and learn about a race team. Go on to every major platform where you get your podcasts. Listen to our show. Give us a five-star rating. Spread it around. Make sure everybody knows. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, that's usually, what is that, Sadler Senator, at Sadler Senator. Yeah. The not they got at you in not Senator Sadler. <laughs> Sadler Senator. Um, ladies and gentlemen, 
this can only grow because you show an interest. We talk about politics. We talk about racing. We talk about wrestling. We talk about so many different things that mean to us that are a part of the American fabric. And we appreciate you listening. It's an honor to sit with Hermie Sadler most nights and most days. It's an, honor, <laughs> it's an honor to be his friend and actually meet all the friends he has. And he demonstrates that I know nobody. But we can't do this without you. So if you get that chance, spread it around. Uh, let people know that we're doing this. I mean, our, our audience is growing exponentially, but we're very appreciative of those that we've always had and those who are just learning about us. We have now a library of 40-some-odd shows, 30-some-odd shows. I keep saying 40, Hermie. Uh, I guess I'm trying to get rid of this year already. 30-some-odd shows. Go back through the library that we have. We, we introduce all of the uh, great people that make a difference in Virginia politics and in racing and in wrestling. You'll enjoy every episode just like I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm leading right. And I'm Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left. We appreciate you listening, and we'll see you again next week. God bless you all. Get the house you want with the payment you want at buywithconrad.com. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this at buywithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. The first step to buying a house is buywithconrad.com.